Is everyone ready? Okay. The, uh, the Honourable Minister of Finance. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, uh, pursuant to Standing Order 83-1, I wish to table a Notice of Ways and Means motion to introduce an Act respecting certain measures in response to COVID-19. Pursuant to Standing Order 83-2, I ask that an Order of the Day be designated for consideration of the motion. The uh, Honourable uh, Government House Leader. Merci, Monsieur le Président, sur la peur d'ordre. Monsieur le Président, on traverse une, une crise sans précédent, une crise qui affecte tous les Canadiens. Donc, il est notre devoir de travailler tous ensemble pour apporter une aide d'urgence rapide. Et c'est pourquoi vous constaterez, Monsieur le Président, qu'il y a eu des consultations entre les partis et vous constaterez qu'il y a un consentement unanime à l'égard de la motion suivante. Et là, je vais vous demander d'être patient, Monsieur le Président que, nonobstant tout article du règlement ordre spécial ou usage habituel de la Chambre, a l'application des articles 17,36.8b, 39.5b et 56.1 du règlement soit suspendu pour cette séance pourvu que les réponses dues aux pétitions et aux questions feuilletons soient déposées à la prochaine séance de la Chambre. B. La motion de, mo de voie et moyens numéro 4, dont avis a été donné plus tôt aujourd'hui, soit agréée, qu'un projet de loi fondé sur les dispositions de cette motion inscrit au nom du ministre des Finances et intitulé « Loi concernant certaines mesures en réponse à la COVID-19 » soit réputé, déposé et lu une première fois, que l'étude à l'étape de la deuxième lecture soit fixée à plus tard aujourd'hui. C. À la suite de l'adoption de cet ordre, la Chambre se forme en comité plénier pour examiner des questions reliées à la pandémie de la COVID-19 pendant au plus d'une heure pourvu que, durant les délibérations du comité, le président puisse présider du fauteuil du président de la Chambre, que, durant les délibérations du comité, le président reconnaisse les députés guidés par les proportions suivies pendant les questions orales, aucun député n'aura la parole pendant plus de cinq minutes pour que les députés puissent poser des questions à un ministre ou à un secrétaire parlementaire agissant au nom du ministre. Les députés peuvent partager leur temps de parole avec un ou plusieurs députés en indiquant à la présidence qu'ils ont l'intention de procéder ainsi. À l'expiration du temps prévu pour le débat ou lorsque plus aucun député ne prend la parole, selon la première éventualité, le comité lève la séance. D. Lorsque le comité plénier lève sa séance, la Chambre entamera le débat sur la motion portant deuxième lecture du projet de loi visé en B. Un député de chaque parti reconnu et un député du Parti vert puissent prendre la parole sur la dite motion pendant au plus dix minutes, suivi de cinq minutes pour les questions et observations, pourvu que les députés peuvent partager leur temps de parole avec un autre député et que, à la fin de la période prévue pour ces débats ou lorsque plus aucun député ne se lèvera pour prendre la parole selon la première éventualité, toute question nécessaire pour disposer de l'étape de la deuxième lecture soit mise aux voix sans plus ample débat ni amendement pourvu que, si un vote par appel nominal est demandé, il ne soit pas différé et que si le projet de loi est adopté à l'étape de la deuxième lecture, il soit renvoyé à un comité plénier réputé étudié en comité plénier, réputé avoir fait l'objet d'un rapport sans amendement, réputé adopté à l'étape du rapport et réputé lu une troisième fois et adopté. E, Monsieur le Président, lorsque le projet de loi visé en B a été lu une troisième fois et adopté, la Chambre s'ajourne jusqu'au lundi 20 avril 2020 sous réserve que pour l'application du règlement, elle soit réputée ajournée conformément à l'article 28 du règlement et, pour plus de certitude, que les dispositions des paragraphes MAP de la motion adoptée le vendredi 13 mars 2020 restent en vigueur. F. Si, pendant la période où la Chambre est ajournée, le président reçoit, reçoit avis des leaders parlementaires des quatre partis reconnus 
qu'il est dans l'intérêt public que la Chambre demeure ajournée jusqu'à une date ultérieure ou jusqu'à un nouvel avis soit donné au président, la Chambre demeure ajournée en conséquence pourvu que, un, dans l'éventualité où le président est dans l'incapacité d'agir pour raison de maladie ou toute autre cause, le vice-président ou l'un ou l'autre des vice-présidents adjoints soit chargé d'agir en son nom ou fin de ce paragraphe. Deuxièmement, dans l'éventualité où la Chambre demeure ajournée au-delà du 20 avril 2020, conformément à ce paragraphe, les mots 1er mai et 31 mai de l'article 81.4a du règlement soient réputés se lire 27 mai et 15 juin, respectivement. G. Pendant la période où la Chambre est ajournée conformément à cet ordre, la Chambre puisse être rappelée conformément à l'article 28.3 du règlement pour l'étude de mesures pour adresser les impacts économiques de la COVID-19 et les impacts sur la vie des Canadiennes et des Canadiens. H. Pendant la période où la Chambre est ajournée conformément à cet ordre, le président du comité permanent de la santé et le président permanent des finances convoquent chacun une réunion de leur comité respectif au moins une fois par semaine, à moins que les WIP des quatre parties reconnues s'entendent pour ne pas avoir de réunion et, deux, dans les 48 heures suivant la réception par courriel par le greffier du comité, d'une demande signée par quatre membres du comité que, durant ces réunions, les membres des dix comités doivent assister et les témoins doivent participer par vidéoconférence ou téléconférence, que les comités se réunissent dans le seul but d'entendre des témoignages concernant des enjeux liés à la réponse du gouvernement à la pandémie de la COVID-19, à condition que, pour plus de certitude, chaque comité puisse entendre des témoignages qui pourraient autrement excéder le mandat du comité en vertu de l'article 18,2 du règlement que pour toutes ces réunions soient rendues disponibles au public via le site Web de la Chambre des communes et que les avis de substitution des membres conformément à l'article 114.2 du règlement puissent être adoptés auprès du greffier de chaque comité par courriel. I. Commençant la semaine du 30 mars 2020, le ministre des Finances ou son délégué fasse rapport au comité permanent des finances aux deux semaines au sujet de toutes les actions entreprises conformément aux parties 3, 8 et 19 de la Loi sur les mesures d'urgence visant la COVID-19 et comparaisse devant le comité pour discuter du rapport pourvu que, jusqu'au 20 avril 2020 ou jusqu'à une date à laquelle la période d'ajournement se prolonge conformément au paragraphe F de cet ordre, de cet ordre, si le comité n'est pas satisfait de la manière dont le gouvernement exerce ses pouvoirs en vertu de la loi, le comité puisse adopter une motion lors d'une réunion par vidéoconférence ou par téléconférence et en faire rapport à la Chambre en le déposant auprès du greffier de la Chambre et que le rapport soit réputé avoir été présenté à la Chambre à cette date. J. Après la présentation de tout rapport conformément, conformément au paragraphe I, le président rappelle la Chambre afin d'étudier une motion que la Chambre prenne note du rapport, que la dite motion soit réputée proposée et ait et, et priorité sur tous les autres travaux pourvu que les délibérations se terminent lorsque le débat sur celle-ci est terminé ou à l'heure ordinaire d'ajournement quotidien et qu'au moins 48 heures d'avis soient données pour toute séance tenue en vertu de ce paragraphe. K. Le comité permanent des finances soit chargé d'entreprendre un examen des dispositions et de l'application de la loi sur les mesures d'urgence visant la COVID-19 six mois après la date de la sanction de cette loi et que le comité fasse rapport de ses constatations à la Chambre au plus tard le 31 mars 2021, pourvu que le comité puisse déposer ce rapport auprès du greffier de la Chambre si la Chambre est ajournée au moment où le rapport est prêt et que le rapport soit réputé avoir été présenté à cette date. Elle, 
À les 30 jours de séance suivant la reprise des séances régulières de la Chambre, conformément au paragraphe E ou F de cet ordre, le gouvernement dépose un rapport global des activités entreprises conformément à la loi sur les mesures d'urgence visant la COVID-19 et que ce rapport soit renvoyé au comité permanent des finances. Et M, la Chambre demande au gouvernement de fournir des mises à jour régulières aux représentants des partis de l'opposition reconnus et non reconnus sur sa gestion de la pandémie de la COVID-19, y compris des conférences téléphoniques ou deux semaines entre les porte paroles en matière de finances des partis de l'opposition et les ministres de, des Finances. Et ça conclut, Monsieur le Président, la motion. Et c'est aussi la réponse d'urgence de notre gouvernement pour aider les Canadiens. Et nous allons y faire, faire, ensemble, faire face ensemble, Monsieur le Président, et nous allons passer à travers ça ensemble. Merci beaucoup. Does the... Does I see the Honorable Opposition House Leader rising on a, on a point? Thank you. Just a point of clarification. Um, I just wanted to clarify uh, Section C, where the uh, House Leader said that we would be resolving to um, Committee of the Whole for a period not exceeding uh, one hour, I believe. Translation said one hour and 45 minutes. So if, uh, if the House Leader could just clarify that. It, thank you. Thank you for it is indeed for one hour, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. As well, um, does the uh, does the honourable uh, government house leader have the unanimous consent of the house to propose this motion? Yes. Uh, the house has heard the terms of the motion. Is it the pleasure of the house to adopt the motion? Yes. Agreed. Yes. yes. Agreed. Yes. Agreed. And so ordered. Pursuant to an order made earlier today, the house shall now resolve itself into committee of the whole. Uh, to consider matters related to COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Debate, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleagues in the official opposition for all their hard work throughout the day. I do want to uh, thank the members of other parties as well as we try to find uh, a resolution to a problem that was created uh, when the government decided to add additional measures to their financial assistance package. Uh, as we said last week, uh, we recognize the unprecedented situation that our country finds itself in. Nous, uh, nous, nous reconnaissons le, le fait que beaucoup des Canadiens et Canadiens vont avoir beaucoup de difficultés dans les jours et les semaines uh, qui viennent et nous sommes prêts à jouer notre part pour trouver les solutions. Uh, we recognize that Canadians are going to face a great deal of difficulty in the days and weeks ahead, and we are here ready to help find solutions. That, that is what we were expecting to do. Uh, now that the government has agreed to our grave concerns about the type of sweeping uh, uh, power that they were going to give themselves, uh, we, we do find uh, that we are in a position where we are able to support this going ahead. Now, that being said, I do have a number of questions for uh, my colleagues across the aisle. Uh, as they will well know, many businesses are on the brink of bankruptcy. Uh, many businesses have been told that they must close their doors. Restaurants, uh, other types of businesses in the service industry, and they are facing a great deal of hardship. The government's original proposal was to provide a 10% wage subsidy. I believe the ministers would acknowledge that the situation has changed from those early days, uh, and that in many cases that will not be sufficient to help individuals uh, stay employed. Uh, will the government consider uh, other additional measures that would keep small businesses afloat during this uh, difficult time? We have uh, called for not only the raising of that wage subsidy, but also to have GST rebated to the small businesses who have uh, collected them over the past few months. That would uh, provide them with a great deal of cash flow that would uh, be able to assist. So will the government be willing to entertain uh, that type of measure? Before the uh, minister answers that, I'm just going to uh, get one little piece of business uh, taken care of here. If I could get the sergeant at arms to just come up. Everyone could just stay put. There's no worries. Uh, no one's getting evacuated from the house. It's, 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 it's okay. <laughs> it's my mistake. The, I believe it was the Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I'm not upset at the fact that we had to take some of my time away based on the 
the change in the, uh, in the house. Um, the, uh, the place I'd like to start, of course, is to recognize the, the nature and the, the scale of the challenge that we're facing today, and to acknowledge that even with the enormous challenges that Canadians are facing, even with the, uh, the significant issues that our economy is facing, we still do not know and cannot know the depth and the duration of the challenge that we're facing. And how we must uh, protect ourselves is by ensuring that we together in this house have the capacity to deal with this on behalf of Canadians. So in that regard, I'm obviously pleased that we're moving forward with the legislation proposed today. The legislation that will allow us to, with the oversight of this house as appropriate, to come forward and to make sure that we can protect Canadians in the short term through health measures that are of critical importance and in the medium term as we think about how we deal with our economic challenges and more importantly pre prepare ourselves for our opportunity to come out of this, this challenge in a way that will show the strength of Canadian, Canadians and Canada for today and for tomorrow. We have put forward measures here today that we believe are going to enable us to support Canadians and also to support Canadian businesses. So we think that that is the way we should be moving ourselves forward. We have put forward measures that will, in fact, provide every Canadian who is finding himself or herself away from work because of sickness, quarantine, supporting one of their, their elderly parents, supporting one of their children who might be away from school due to sickness or just because they're away from school, or importantly, if they're away from work because they can't actually be at work or their employer has asked them to... Uh, to Unfortunately, I do have to allow for one more question from the Leader of Opposition. It's two minutes. Uh, it's, a, it's the same amount of time that's asked the question, basically. The Honourable uh, Official Opposition Leader has a, one minute to ask a question. Okay. Well, uh, I, will acknowledge the, uh, I will acknowledge that we are in agreement with, uh, with much of what the Finance Minister has said. I think we are ch heading into some uncharted territory. Uh, there will be many Canadians that have never looked to government before for assistance that will now be looking uh, to government. We must make sure that we find a way uh, to provide that support to them, help pe keep people in their apartments, in their homes, able to put food on the table. Uh, one way to uh, ensure that the effects of this downturn last even longer is if the government were or if, or if our central bank were in any way to consider uh, quantitative easing measures. Uh, that is a, a guaranteed way to make sure that the, the, the lingering effects of this downturn will last years and years beyond what it would need to do. So will the finance minister uh, commit to uh, assuring the House that uh, quantitative easing, printing money, uh, is not something that this government would support, certainly not something that the government would request the Bank of Canada to consider. The Honourable Finance Minister, a brief answer. Madam Speaker, uh, first of all, if I can continue where I left off, our measure would ensure that every Canadian who is off work for, uh, for any reason that is meaning that they are not going to be able to have the income that they previously had, and they had income the year before, will be able to get a, a wage uh, subsidy for them. And uh, that, of course, will be very important in allowing them to deal with the challenge that they're facing. So this is not only providing the employee with support, but it's ensuring that the firm that they work for is able to have the kind of support through that, uh, those funds. That we see is critically important, and that will allow those firms to, to have the people off work that need to be off work, and the ones that are at work, not at work. With respect to anything to do with the Bank of Canada, I think it's important to note that the Bank of Canada is independent of government and will remain so under this government. I will just uh, remind the members that it's uh, five minutes uh, for questions and comments together. Um, and so if the question uh, is posed for two minutes, then there's two minutes to answer, up to two minutes to answer. Um, and if, it's, if there's only one minute left, then it means it's only half, um, uh, 30 seconds to ask a question, 30 seconds to answer. I would ask people to be mindful of the time and to maybe look at me so I can give them the signal. Uh, reprise de débat, l'honorable député de question, uh, c'est commentaire, the, the honorable member, l'honorable député de Juliette. Oui, merci, madame la présidente. Monsieur Morneau, vous le savez, on vit une pandémie sans, euh, sans comme une mesure qui met l'économie sur pause. Puis ça, ça crée beaucoup de détresse dans la population. On le voit, là, c'est près d'un million de demandes de chômage qu'il y a eu. Les gens s'inquiètent parce qu'ils n'arrivent pas à contacter le service et euh, ils se demandent quand est-ce qu'ils vont avoir le, le chèque. 
Qu'est-ce que votre gouvernement, M. Morneau, va faire pour accélérer le processus et euh, que les gens puissent avoir une réponse? Et au député de Joliette, il devrait adresser des questions et des commentaires à la... À... Je crois qu'on a le droit de nommer les gens. C'est encore à la chaise, hein? Okay, que c'est encore à, à, la, à la présidence euh, qui doit demander et il ne devrait pas euh, nommer une personne à la Chambre qui est dans la Chambre non plus. Point d'ordre, l'honorable député Joliette. Comme nous en comité plénier, à ma connaissance, nous avons le droit de nommer euh, les, euh, les gens. Euh, non. Euh, L'honorable député de Joliette euh, n'a pas les bonnes euh, instructions. Il doit adresser les, les questions et commentaires à, à la, la, la Chambre, à la, à, la, à la présidence, et on ne devrait pas nommer les gens par leur, les parlementaires par leur nom ou les ministres. Euh, L'honorable ministre de Finances. Mm -hmm. Madame la Présidente, c'est une, une question très importante. Nous savons que c'est très important d'avoir accès aux fonds euh, pour tous les gens euh, à travers notre pays qui sont dans une situation difficile à cause de la COVID-19. Donc, c'est pour ça que nous avons trouvé une solution, une solution qui va être très simple, qui va être très vite. Et de cette façon, les gens peuvent avoir leur argent, leur argent dans les prochaines deux ou trois semaines, nous pensons euh, à peu près le, le première semaine d'avril, et ça c'est très important pour eux, et c'est très important quand même pour notre économie. Honorable député de Joliette. Madame la Présidente, je tiens à remercier le ministre des Finances pour euh, rassurer la population à ce sujet. Aussi, euh, il est important d'oublier personne, que personne ne tombe dans une craque. Euh, évidemment, il y a les chômeurs. Il y a les travailleuses, travailleurs qui n'ont pas assez d'heures pour avoir accès à l'assurance-emploi. Il y a les travailleurs autonomes aussi. Donc là, il y a le programme qui va être mis en place pour ces gens. Toutefois, a, je pense aux petits propriétaires de petites entreprises, souvent qui n'ont même pas d'employés. Et euh, ce qu'on nous a dit dans les brefages techniques jusqu'à maintenant, c'est que quand c'est des petites entreprises enregistrées, les gens ne pourraient pas bénéficier de, du soutien de, de revenus. Alors que souvent, le restaurant est fermé, euh, ils sont forcés à fermer, ils n'ont plus aucun revenu, euh, sinon euh, pouvoir retarder leurs impôts et euh, accéder à des prêts. Est-ce qu'il euh, va y avoir quelque chose de plus pour ces personnes-là, comme la mesure de soutien euh, aux revenus? Merci, Madame la Présidente. Honorable ministre des Finances. Madame la Présidente, nous, euh, nous continuons de considérer comment nous pouvons assurer les gens qui ont une petite et moyenne entreprise qu'ils vont être dans une euh, bonne situation. S'il si, euh, y a une situation où une personne est, euh, a eu euh, 5 000 de revenus pendant les derniers 12 mois et ils ont euh, eu une situation où ils ne peuvent pas avoir de revenus à cause de COVID-19, c'est ça les conditions. De cette façon, quelqu'un qui est le chef d'une petite entreprise a le même accès de, de notre bénéfice que les autres gens. Ça, c'est très important. Mais bien sûr, nous allons continuer de considérer comment nous pouvons assurer tous les gens au Canada qui vont être dans une position où ils peuvent avoir une possibilité de, de confronter le, cette situation difficile. Il reste deux minutes, l'honorable député de Joliette. Bien, Madame la Présidente, je tiens à remercier le ministre des Finances pour cette clarification. Ça enlève un grand souci pour beaucoup de gens dans nos circonscriptions. Euh, pour la mesure de soutien aux sécurités de revenus, les versements, euh, nous attendons toujours la grille de calcul. Euh, lors des brefages techniques, on ne pouvait pas encore nous fournir de moment ou euh, d'idées à quoi pourrait ressembler cette grille de calcul-là. Est-ce que le ministre des Finances peut euh, nous indiquer, euh, un, à quoi pourrait ressembler cette grille de calcul et deux, à quel moment est-ce qu'on pourrait avoir justement accès euh, à cette grille pour évaluer les montants qui pourront être reçus? Merci, Madame la Présidente. L'honorable ministre des Finances a une minute pour répondre. Madame la Présidente, euh, nous savons que la situation est très dynamique. De cette façon, on doit avoir plus d'informations quand nous sommes euh, prêts, mais ça va être dans les, dans les prochains euh, jours, c'est sûr, et ça c'est très important, je sais. Nous travaillons pour assurer que nous avons les, 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 les nombres exacts euh, très, euh, dans, le, dans le très proche avenir. 
Il reste 20 sec euh, 44 secondes, c'est bon? Uh, the Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Uh, merci, Madame la Présidente. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Finance as well. We know that in the last week alone, nearly a million Canadians applied for EI. Uh, Canadians are faced with an impossible choice. Do they stay home and help prevent the spread of an illness, but risk not being able to pay for their rent or put food on the table, or do they go to work and risk spreading an illness to their loved ones and to themselves? People can't wait for help until April or May. They need help immediately. We know there's so many workers now that are in the gig economy, freelance and contract workers who need immediate supports. Will the Minister of Finance consider our proposal to send $2,000 to each Canadian monthly while we're in this crisis and an additional $250 for each child? Uh, this form of universal uh, basic income would provide direct supports to Canadians who desperately need it. The RO Minister of Finance has one minute. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, we are ensuring that every Canadian who is impacted through this COVID-19 uh, is in a situation where they can face up to this challenge. The announcements we, we have made uh, with this legislation allow us to create a benefit that everyone who has been in a situation where they previous in the past 12 months earned $5,000 or more and that their revenue because of sickness, because of quarantine, because they do need to stay at home because they're protecting themselves and their families, because their employer has asked them to stay at home and they're not receiving revenue as a result. Those people will have access to the benefit. That we think is critically important and in that way I think I can assure the member that we have in fact taken his, his very legitimate question and come up with a solution. The R member for Burnaby South. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the, for the answer. Um, I've, I've spoken to Indigenous leaders across the country, and they are highlighting some serious concerns that they have. Indigenous communities, as a result of historic and ongoing injustice, have inadequate access to clean drinking water, housing, and healthcare services. As a result, leaders are concerned that their communities will not be able to deal with the COVID-19 if it is exposed in their community and if it starts to spread. So as a result of this, they're concerned about the lack of resources and equipment and supplies. So my question is to the Minister of Finance, what is the plan to ensure that Indigenous communities get the supports they need? And uh, I want to also make it clear that isolation tents are not going to cut it. What is the plan to help Indigenous communities in this crisis? The RO Finance Minister has up to one minute to respond. Uh, Madam Speaker, in, in a time of, of challenge like we're facing, we recognize that Canadians in many different situations are ex facing extreme challenges, challenges which we've never seen before. We recognize that Indigenous peoples, uh, First Nations, Inuit Nation, Métis Nation, are indeed facing real challenges, especially when they live in places that are remote or uh, unable to access uh, the appropriate health care. So that is why, when we came out with our measures, we, we recognized this. We recognized by putting more than $300 million into our package that we would need to work together. We also recognize that we need to work together to consider the specific situations that people are facing in particular parts of our country. We will be doing that right now over the course of the next number of days, and I would invite the member opposite, if he has suggestions, to get them to me, and we will most certainly consider them. The yeah, Honourable Member for Burnaby South, there's one minute left. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the, the big concerns we have is, while we are dealing with the immediate crisis of COVID-19 and the immediate impacts on society, we also need to make sure that people, that we have a plan uh, once this healthcare immediate issue is dealt with and we look at the recovery. And people need to know that they have a job to return to. A lot of small businesses right now are, are struggling with the impacts of COVID-19. So what I'm suggesting to the government is uh, we need to increase the wage subsidy. Right now, the government's proposing 10%. We're suggesting we need at least 75% a wage subsidy or more, will the government commit to increasing the wage subsidy to at least 75% to help small businesses to ensure that people have workers have a job to return to? The Honourable uh, Minister of Finance. 
Uh, Madam Speaker, this, is, this situation is moving quickly, and I appreciate that all of the, the members in this chamber uh, have not uh, in any way had the opportunity to fully understand what it is that we're trying to achieve. We are, in fact, delivering a wage subsidy directly to Canadians. So what we are doing is making sure that those Canadians that are furloughed from their employment, meaning they're not separated from their employment, but they're off work and not able to get income from their employment, whether it be because they're at home or whether it be because they're sick, uh, in, in those situations, they will be getting the, uh, the benefit that we are proposing, the emergency benefit. And in that way, what we can ensure is that wage subsidy is not only that amount, but plus for the employees that stay at work, it's the additional 10 percent. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Samilkami Nicola. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to direct my question to the Minister of Employment. Applications for regular EI have overwhelmed the system and no one can get a hold of Service Canada to apply. With a whole new benefit, how will the caseload be managed to ensure that people can apply, and how are staff resources being redirected to support Canadians? The Honourable uh, Member, uh, Minister, sorry. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. So we have intentionally, Madam Speaker, created this new benefit separate from the EI system so, as so, so that we can continue to process claims that were filed before Mar March 15th and we can continue to process claims for other benefits like maternity and parental benefits since March 15th. Any claim that has been filed since March 15th will be channeled into this new Canada Emergency Response Benefit and any EI claim that's filed between now and when this new application for this benefit arises will be also channeled into the new benefit. I can assure you that we have redirected every single possible resource to Service Canada. I think the number, I apologize if it's not exactly accurate, is about 1,300 people have been redirected to work and process these claims and answer these questions. We've had an enormous volume of EI uh, claims. We've had an enormous number of uh, questions to Service Canada, and we are doing our utmost to answer them and respond as quickly as possible. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Smilkin Nicola. Madam Speaker, many people who are about to go on parental leave have been laid off and have had to start EI, which will reduce the time that they can be on parental leave. Will their leave be extended to ensure that they can take their planned time with their new child? The Honourable Minister of Employment and Workforce Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Any EI entitlement that a worker currently has will not in any way be impacted by the new Canada Emergency Response Benefit. So whatever you are entitled to now, you'll be entitled to after the 16 weeks. Our member for Central Okanagan, Ms. Milkami Nicola. Madam Speaker, last Friday the government announced temporary foreign workers already here would be extended from one year to two. And in certain industries, it will be easier and faster to bring in a temporary foreign worker. Now, we see in this legislation tonight the uh, definition of worker, it says resident of Canada. Does this new benefits apply to citizens and permanent residents or to anyone who lives here, such as those on a work visa? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, the, uh, the intent behind this new benefit is to deal with the crisis that we're facing. So. Uh, what we've done is we've created, as we said, a new benefit, and the idea behind the new benefit is that anyone who has received revenue in the last 12 months of $5,000 or more, and anyone who has found themselves that their, that their amount of income has gone down to nothing as a result of COVID-19, that is the attestation that we are asking that individual to make. We are then adjudicating that claim on a simple form that will allow us to move forward to get them the money as rapidly as possible through the Canada Revenue Agency, which is the system that is the largest and most robust that the government has. The yeah, member for Central Okanagan, Samilkami Nicola. Madam Speaker, we're looking for clarity. People here as temporary foreign workers that lose their jobs, will they be able to apply for this benefit? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, as I said, the criteria are as I laid out. We also need to recognize that in a time of extreme challenge, a time in which we are working to make sure that we protect Canadians that are facing challenge as a result of this uh, coronavirus, that we need to move fast and we need to find a way to get revenue, get sources of income to people as rapidly as possible. We are working to make sure that all of the details are deliberated on and delivered as soon as humanly possible. One minute left. The Honourable Member of Central Okanagan, Samilkami Nicola. 
Madam Speaker, this bill states that you're not eligible if you have received employment insurance after your employment ceases. Will a fisher or someone in the tourism hospitality who was laid off last year and got EI, but then now has exhausted it, but the job that they expected this summer is gone due to COVID-19, will they be eligible for this benefit? The Honourable Minister of Employment and Workforce Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If that individual, um, given your fact pattern, were to meet the eligibility of 15 years of age, having earned $5,000 in the past year and being a resident of Canada, I believe, to the best of my knowledge, yes. The time is up. The Honourable Deputy de Charlebourg, Saint Charles. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je me au ministre de la Sécurité publique. Donc, Monsieur le ministre, compte tenu de la situation, euh, est-ce que le ministre a mis, a mis en place un plan de contingence avec le secteur privé afin de protéger et maintenir les opérations des infrastructures critiques canadiennes, comme les ports, les aéroports, les centrales électriques et les chemins de fer? The Honourable uh, Minister of Public Safety. Yeah, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the member opposite for what I think believe is a very important question. Uh, we are working with the whole of government in, in reaching out to all of the ten critical uh, infrastructure sectors in this country to ensure continuity of, of supply and services throughout the country. It's being very, very carefully monitored, and, and we are working diligently to ensure that all of the critical infrastructure sectors will be maintained. Merci. Comme on le voit actuellement, Monsieur le Ministre, les grandes provinces comme le Québec et l'Ontario ont des ressources et sont en contrôle de la situation. Cependant, nous savons aussi que les plus petites provinces vont avoir besoin d'aide. Est-ce que votre gouvernement est en mesure de les aider sans avoir recours à la loi des mesures d'urgence? Je vais rappeler le député qui doit adresser la, la parole à la, à, la, à la présidence. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Yes, thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm, I'm pleased to advise you um, that, that I'm in contact with um, our uh, uh, provinces and territorial partners several times each week. We've been working very closely with them and listening to their concerns, responding to any requests that they may have. Um, and, and we do have an ability through the Emergency Management Act to provide uh, resources uh, to a province should it be necessary. Merci. J'aimerais savoir, par contre, on a depuis, euh, il y a plus, il y a un million, un million de Canadiens qui sont venus au Canada entre le 14 et le 20 mars. En une semaine seulement, un million de personnes ont franchi nos frontières. Certains des commentaires que nous avons reçus des agents frontaliers nous disaient que plusieurs personnes sont entrées au pays avec des symptômes grippaux visibles. Sachant que le virus est venu au Canada par la frontière, le ministre a-t-il recommandé au premier ministre de fermer les frontières dès le début et exiger de chaque voyageur face à un isolement uh, Madam Speaker, on, based, based on the advice that we have received from our public health officials, all persons entering Canada are, first of all, asked with respect to their symptomology whether or not they have headache, fever, or any other symptoms of COVID-19. Um, if they are, they're immediately directed to public health, um, a public health referral to receive um, further inquiry and treatment if, if necessary. And every person entering Canada um, from an international destination in the United States or anywhere else in the world is also advised to enter into a 14-day period of self-isolation. They are required, as they enter, to acknowledge that they have been asked about symptoms and to acknowledge that they have been given the advice to seek to, to pursue 14 days of isolation. Honorable Deputy de Charlebourg, Rose Sechard, yes, two minutes. Two minutes, merci. Euh, selon certains experts, Madame la Présidente, la violence familiale devrait augmenter en raison de des conséquences reliées au virus, à l'isolement, à tout ce qui, qui gravite autour. J'aimerais savoir, de la part du ministre, si le gouvernement a pris des, envisagé des mesures supplémentaires pour la sécurité des femmes, des personnes âgées et des enfants vulnérables. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And I will say that this is something that we're quite aware of. Uh, we know that all kinds of violence increases when people are under stress. We also know that issues around substance use and mental health uh, are exacerbated when people are under a, tre a tremendous amount of stress. That's why I've been working with my colleague, Minister Monsef, 
uh, uh, sorry, the Minister of, uh, of uh, uh, Gender Equality to ensure that we have uh, partnerships in place to support people that are vulnerable in these circumstances. I will also say that we were working very diligently on a mental health app that will be available to all Canadians in the days to come. Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker, this is an all hands on deck moment and we want to thank all the organizations that are working so hard to protect uh, both the safety of women and children. Thank you. Question. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je dois savoir de la part du ministre, actuellement, quand il y a des paquebots, des, des cargos qui viennent au Canada, on nous apprend que les, les membres du personnel de l'équipage débarquent du navire et ils ne sont pas contrôlés. Est-ce que le ministre a de l'information là-dessus? L'honorable ministre de Transport a une brève réponse. Présidente, euh, selon les droits internationaux, quand euh, un navire arrive dans un port, les membres, les, les, les personnes qui travaillent à bord du navire ont, par loi internationale, accès au port pour une période qui est très limitée et euh, c'est quelque chose que nous respectons en ce moment et euh, nous allons continuer de, de, de surveiller cette situation, mais c'est quelque chose que nous avons l'obligation de respecter par la loi internationale. On prend une brève pause pour, euh, tel que prescrit, They're just doing this, the changeover. C'est bon? Tu me dis quand je suis prête? The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Many Canadians are stranded abroad, worried and wanting to come home at the first opportunity. I'd like to extend a thanks to the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the collaboration and information that he has given and worked with all of our colleagues in this House to get as many Canadians home as quickly as possible. But we also recognize that there are many Canadians abroad who may have to stay in place. I'm wondering if the Minister could give them advice and I identify what kind of support his office could offer them. The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the great collaboration. Uh, what we are doing, Madam Speaker, is probably the largest repatriation effort in Canada's history, in peacetime at least. And I want to say that uh, no one is going to be left behind, Madam Speaker. We are doing, as the member said, the largest repatriation. We're helping people to, to come home. And for those that we won't be able to come home, we will provide consular services wherever they might be, uh, Madam Speaker. We have already worked with our mission, identify what we can do, and we will continue to help Canadians wherever they might be. Our member for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. During this crisis, there will be a need for critical medical items, many of which are not manufactured in Canada. Will the government ensure that those critical items are manufactured in Canada? Federal Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And in fact, procuring of medical devices, including personal protective equipment, testing kits, and a number of other items that are in desperate need all around the globe is uh, a, a major preoccupation of mine. And certainly the work of my department in partnership with the Minister of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development is looking at domestic manufacturing of many of these items. Uh, I am very encouraged by the volume of uh, manufacturers and suppliers that have stepped up to be part of a Canadian solution in this time of immense need. Thank you. The R member for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Well, Madam Speaker, with many of these items uh, short supply and supply chains under strain and borders closed, we're wondering if the minister could shed some light on whether or not those items will remain in Canada. The R Minister of Health. Madam Speaker, uh, the organizations that have offered to uh, support manufacturing of medical devices and other kinds of things that we need in Canada for this unprecedented public health crisis is really one that is about making sure Canadians have what they need and Canadian health care workers have what they need. And so I want to thank all of the manufacturers who have been so incredibly prompt to ensure that we know about their uh, abilities and their, and, and their, uh, their, uh, their plans. We'll be working with them very closely to help accelerate access to those products. The Honourable for, Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond and Hill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. How will the government ensure that these criti critical items are distributed to appropriate organizations according to priority and need 
at a fair price rather than a first come first serve basis or going to the highest bidder. The RO Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, the Federal Provincial Territorial Partnership is one of the ways that we make sure that equipment is distributed according to need and according to population size. Those conversations are ongoing. There is um, working groups at every level of government on this issue of procurement and distributing it in a way that actually meets the need of the community at its present time. We'll continue that work with our partners to make sure that as we see the evolution of this pandemic in Canada, we have resources in the right spot at the right time. The RM member for Oak Ridge, Aurora, Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And so my last question would be around how quickly will we see those manufacturers being able to get into motion and will the government be setting the levels which they will be required or asked to produce at? Will the government be buying and setting those levels so that they know what and amounts to produce, and how quickly will we be seeing that? The Minister has about 30 seconds to respond. Uh, the short answer is yes, Madam Speaker. We're working very closely with the identified manufacturers who have come forward to date to ensure that the product that they're manufacturing meets the specifications of the practitioners who will be using it, and we'll continue that work to make sure that what they design is what Canada needs. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, Al Albertans have been struggling for years. The un unemployment rate amongst young men has been, was approaching 20 percent. Nearly $200 billion in oil and gas projects have been cancelled or stalled, and 200,000 Canadian oil and gas workers have lost their jobs in just the last five years. And this is all before COVID-19. Albertans need help. Madam Speaker, what is, the, what is this government doing to help Albertans doing the, during these unprecedented times? The RO Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, the, uh, the member opposite points out a, a, an enormous challenge that we're facing in Alberta. Really, I would say that there are three things facing Alberta at the same time, in particular for the energy sector. We have a situation where we have lowest prices that we've seen in a long time because of the OPEC challenges that are going on. We have equ equity markets around the world that are in turmoil. And on top of that, obviously, we have COVID-19. This is a real challenge. We are working right now to think about how we can ensure that uh, oil and gas sector, energy sector have adequate access to financing so they can bridge their time through this time. And of course, the measure we're putting in place will allow every worker who is off as a result of this situation to get the benefit so they can face up to supporting their family in a challenging time. Our member, member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Madam Speaker, Albertans need a plan to receive the money that the government is laying out, not a game of wait and see. Similarly, there are, there are $21 billion worth of energy projects in the queue of regulatory review, with at least one waiting for cabinet approval. The government can direct reg regulators to speed up the reviews while maintaining the evidence and science-based approach with the highest standards for which Canada is renowned. Will this government fast-track major energy projects to get Alberta's energy sector back on its feet, to get people working again, and to get the Canadian economy going now and in the future? The RO Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, we are in an emergency setting. We know that what we, we must do is deal with the challenges facing people across the country. But Yes, uh, we have significant challenges in Alberta that we must be dealing with on an emergency basis, and that is exactly the approach that we are taking. So when I talk about the fact that we are ensuring that we can support the energy sector with the kind of uh, opportunities that will allow them to bridge through this difficult time, we are doing that literally as we speak. We continue to be working on this, and I will have more to say in the very near term about how we can support that sector, how we can support, importantly, the workers who are recognizing that they don't currently have potentially opportunities, and they need opportunities for the future. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and hopefully we hear that sooner than later. Madam Speaker, we already know that unemployment is at unprecedented levels, and people are struggling to pay the bills. The carbon tax makes these bills even higher at a time when every dollar saved is crucial for Canadians to be able to provide for their families. Will the government postpone the 50 per cent increase of the carbon tax scheduled for April 1st? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, we are doing everything we can to make sure our economy is re resilient in a time of, of challenge. Uh, what I think it's important to recognize is that 
as we look to putting money into the economy, money into people's hands, uh, we need to make sure that we are doing things in a way that makes sense. So we are adding government resources into the economy where is appropriate. I think what everyone in this House knows, and I, and I know what we need to continue to remind Canadians of, is that the approach that we've taken towards the pricing of carbon means that while people do uh, put some uh, money into those carbon prices, they get that money back, meaning that that money actually stays in the economy. Uh, there's one minute left. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Millwoods. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On Monday, the Minister of Agriculture announced additional funds to Farm Credit Canada, but producers need cash flow now to pay for spring inputs like seed, fertilizer, and fuel. How will the funds through Farm Credit Canada be allocated and how quickly? Will these be interest-free loans and will all commodity groups qualify? The RO Minister of Finance, uh, about Speaker. 35 seconds. How many seconds? Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the question. We recognize that sectors across Canada are facing challenges as a result of COVID-19, and that's the reason that in, in, with respect to the uh, government uh, crown corporations, we've changed so that we can actually remove the limits. That'll mean that Farm Credit Canada has more access to capital so they can put that out to work in the agricultural sector, which we know will be very important. So we will be working with them to make sure that they have that access to capital immediately. The Honourable Member for New Brunswick Southwest. Uh, good evening, Madam Speaker. Thank you. I'll be splitting my time with the member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, uh, Rideau Lakes, please. Uh, my question is either for the Minister of Employment or Finance. Uh, does, or pardon me, can small business owners collect the emergency support benefit and continue to run a business? Do they need to be not working or can they be working to rescue their business while collecting the benefit? Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, the, the conditions that we're laying out are, are very simple. So if someone has been in a position where over the last 12 months they have earned $5,000 or more, and if they are finding themselves with no income as a result of COVID-19 for reasons of being home or perhaps, for example, their business doesn't have any revenue, then they will be able to uh, go forward and get that benefit, meaning that that individual who runs a business that has no revenue that did have revenue before will be able to apply for that benefit. Our member for New Brunswick Southwest. Thank you. Uh, interest rates on BDC loans are too high. What is the plan to bring them down so Ottawa doesn't cripple small businesses? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, Madam Speaker, we are obviously uh, making sure that as we move forward with our plan with the uh, business credit availability program that the access to those funds are done on a commercial basis. That's the way the BDC works. We'll be working to make sure that happens and supporting uh, credit guarantees behind that ensure that credit actually gets out to the market. The Honourable Member for New Brunswick Southwest. Uh, unfortunately, rates as high as 17% are just too high when you add in the variable. Large business owners can, or large businesses can see relief in this package. Individuals can as well. What about small businesses? How are we going to help small businesses, the micro businesses, the mom and pop operations, bridge this uh, 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 economic shock beyond the me measures, the unemployment measures and similar measures like that? What are we doing to help small businesses? The RO Minister has 30 seconds to respond. Madam Speaker, there, there are a number of ways. First, of course, by uh, supporting employees so that they can actually have their employees off. If they have employees, that's critically important. Second, a wage subsidy for any employees that stay. We've also said that we're going to defer any taxes owing up until August 31st, which is important. So there's uh, multiple ways that we're supporting uh, small businesses, and we remain uh, open to considering things that we might need to do in the future to ensure that we have businesses that are able to bridge this gap. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, COVID-19 is having immediate and devastating impacts on the tourism industry across Canada. Hotel and accommodations, restaurants, resorts and other attractions are all being hit hard by this terrible virus. With the busy summer tourism season quickly approaching, and no end in sight for COVID-19. Can the government provide details to assure workers in the tourism industry that there will be an economic aid package provided to them similar or greater than what was provided after the SARS outbreak in 2003? 
The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, uh, again, the, the conditions under which people will be able to get the new Canada Emergency Response Program aid is that they need to satisfy just two simple conditions. They need to have had $5,000 worth of income in the last 12 months, and they need to find themselves in a position where their income has gone to nothing as a result of, of COVID-19. Those are the conditions. They will be available to uh, Canadians across the country. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Granville Thousand Islands, Rideau Lakes. The crisis is putting a massive burden on municipalities. Municipalities are being asked to help fund food banks, help the homeless, cancel water and sewer, garbage, collection bills, and even property taxes. What is the government's plan to increase funding to municipalities to allow them to continue to help Canadians get through this very challenging time? The R uh, Minister of families, children, and social development. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for that really important question. And in our response to COVID-19, one of the things that our government has really prioritized is to make sure that we're there for our vulnerable populations. This means uh, that we are proposing to invest $157.5 million uh, on the federal anti-homelessness response, which will go uh, to help directly 58 communities to make sure that uh, they have flexible funding to ensure that our vulnerable population, especially the homeless population, is taken care of at this difficult time. There's only 20 seconds left. Well, uh, Madam Speaker, just very quickly, if the government can tell me what measures they're going to put in place to help protect seniors who make up a very vulnerable part of our population. Answer from the minister. Madam Speaker, again, a very important question. We are making sure that uh, we, we, we fund uh, those vulnerable populations and work with, with communities across the country that are setting tables to make sure that there's coordination to ensure that Meals on, on Wheels and other important programs for seniors continue. The R member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I'll be splitting my time with the member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Three quick questions for the Finance Minister. First, will, when will the government release the budget? Second, will it release a revised fiscal and economic update? And third, if so, when? The RO Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, uh, I'd like to thank the member for his question. We're obviously in, in unprecedented times. We are dealing with this emergency uh, immediately, and that's why we move forward with this plan. We will be coming forward, of course, with some details about when we can move forward on an economic and fiscal plan. That, of course, in a very dynamic economic situation is one in which we want to carefully make sure that we have the appropriate information to make those plans, and we're looking forward to doing that uh, when the House resumes. Our member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Uh, this pandemic may push certain provinces into bankruptcy. What planning is, is the government undertaking in the event a province needs support? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, it is, uh, it is absolutely the case that a number of our provinces are facing significant challenges uh, immediately. I would say that all provinces are facing challenges because of the reduction in income that they're going to see. We've done uh, numerous things to help. Certainly, we've been working together with the Bank of Canada to make sure that there is access in the uh, capital markets for provincial debts. That will help them to fund their finances during a difficult time. And of course, we're working more directly with, uh, with provinces. And one of the advantages of the bill that we put forward is it'll enable us to continue to do so. The R member for Wellington, Halton Hills, one minute. A, food about Canada, a question about Canada's food supply. Food processors have been asked to maintain current staff levels to ensure Canada's food supply. Apparently, CFIA recently decided to reduce hours for inspectors in response to COVID-19. This is reducing food processing capacity. Will the government do something about the situation? The Honourable Minister of Health, uh, 30 seconds to respond. Oh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I know that my colleague, the Minister of Agriculture, is working on this problem as we speak. We know that Canada's food supply is integral to the health of Canadians, and we're doing everything we can to ensure that food supply uh, uh, chain remains strong and viable. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. 
Madam Chair, Canada must look at international comparisons and copy strategies used by countries who have been successful at controlling COVID-19. South Korea provides one such example. Their approach emphasizes widely available testing and tracking of the spread of the virus, making people aware of specific places where they might have been exposed and providing them with the test results as quickly as possible. This targeted testing and tracking approach has helped South Korea turn the corner. Taiwan's approach has been similar and similarly effective. Has the government studied and is the government uh, preparing to adopt the very successful successful containment model used by Asian democracies who also have more experience with pandemic control. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and in fact, that's exactly what we're doing. We're studying a number of different models that have been successful. Of course, their uh, epidemiological curve is different than ours. Their outbreak uh, scenario is different than ours. But nonetheless, there are many ideas that are being shared across the globe. Obviously, this is the first pandemic of this size in over 100 years. And so uh, uh, with the lack of a vaccine or other treatments that uh, reduce severity, uh, social distancing and other kinds of methods around tracking the disease are all we have at this point. Point. The Honourable Member of Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Madam Chair, to emulate these models, we need to have widely available testing, and that just isn't the case uh, right now. Uh, compared to the South Korean model, we've had very restrictive testing protocols in Canada. One frontline physician told me that he has to tell patients, you probably have COVID and should self-isolate, but we don't have the capacity to test you in certain situations. So what is the government's plan to massively ramp up our testing capacity? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. In fact, we've conducted well over 120,000 uh, tests to date. Uh, I would note that that's more than the United States in total. But in, in, uh, in addition to that, we have uh, a fast-tracked approval for uh, new testing kits in Canada that will make uh, a variety of uh, options in terms of testing uh, more plentiful across the country. We're working with our provincial and territorial partners to make sure we have a strategy that makes sense for our country. Thank you. Uh, 30 seconds left. The Honourable Member of Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Madam Chair, those numbers are not enough and the U.S. comparisons are not enough. I want to quickly ask the Finance Minister, uh, we know that the charitable sector is going to be struggling. Groups have proposed matching programs as well as an increase to the charitable tax rate in order to simulate the charitable tax sector. What measures are being contemplated to support the charitable sector? The Honourable Minister of Families, Children and Social Services, uh, Social Speaker, Development. Uh, I, want to thank, I want to thank the Honourable Member for a really important question. Uh, we've been talking to, uh, consulting with the nonprofit and charitable sector uh, to hear their concerns around how they're able to, uh, to be, remain resilient and bounce back from uh, this challenge of COVID-19. But as we do that, as we look at uh, assisting them, we have to make sure that we're guided, guided by their expertise on the ground and also making sure that we increase the impact of every dollar that we invest in them. The Honourable Member for North Island, Power River. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm really happy that we're here in the House. It's late, it's been a long day, but I just want to say that I know Canadians across this country are looking for action, and I'm glad that we're here getting this important step done. One of the concerns that I want to bring to this House today is there are people that are ineligible for the supports. They don't qualify for EI or the emergency support benefit. I'm talking about folks like travel agents who earn commissions and will continue working unpaid as people are cancelling all of their vacations right now, which means their commissions are being returned, or people who are working uh, that rely on tips for their income who are now with the EI seeing barely 30% of their income, or people who are facing reduced work hours and income but are still working to support Canadians but don't have enough to pay their everyday living expenses. I just want to hear from this government how those people are going to be supported through this crisis. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, Madam Speaker, this is an important question and we want to assure Canadians that we are creating this benefit in the goal of making sure that people who are directly impacted by COVID-19 are supported. So again, whether a travel agent or whether someone who is in a, in a small business or whether someone is in uh, any form of the gig economy, if they have had $5,000 worth of income over the past 12 months, and if they don't have any income as a result of this COVID-19, so their income goes away, they will in fact be able to go forward and get that, that benefit and support themselves uh, based on this, this new situation. So we are, we are ensuring that that is the case and we will continue to make sure that we consider other issues as we move forward to protect Canadians. Our member for North Island, Powell River. 
Uh, thank you, through you, Madam Speaker, to uh, the Minister. Another group of people that I'm very concerned about during this process uh, is the Canadian seniors in our country. The reality is they are the most vulnerable of all of us. We want to protect them and see them safe through this really trying time. I know that so many seniors across this country are doing their best to follow all public health guidelines and they're trying to stay safe and in their homes. But this means for many of them having to have things delivered, paying extra costs for delivery, looking at having people do tasks for them that they can no longer do for themselves. I know that so many seniors are based on a fixed income. They often are close to the poverty line. I'm just wondering, is there any way that we are going to see su seniors supported in this time? The our Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, one of the measures that we put forward is an increase in the GST low-income credit. And so this increase in the GST low-income credit helps a very, very large number of seniors who are challenged. Uh, 80 to 85 percent of individual seniors and 40 to 45 percent of seniors that are in a couple. So this will have a significant impact on helping them through this challenging time, recognizing that their sources of income, the old age security and the guaranteed income supplement, stay along with, with their, uh, their situation. So they are not experiencing a decline in revenue, and for the large majority they will experience an advantage through the GST low income tax credit one time that we're doing in the month of May. The Honourable Member for North Island Power River. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Another serious concern that I have across this country is the issue of housing. We know that many people are facing significant vulnerability in housing. And what we're hearing is that not everybody is being allowed to defer their mortgage for the six months by the banks. Deferrals will still accrue interest. And some banks are actually saying that the amount due will have to be paid in a lump sum at the end of the deferral period all while people aren't able to work or sustain the income that they were before. Other jurisdictions have already said that there will be blank, blanket freezes on all mortgages with no accrued interest or lump sum payments. This is happening in other countries. I'm really curious as well about what kind of resources there will be for people who are renting. These issues are continuing to grow. I would like to know if the minister will mandate a freeze on all mortgages and find supports for rental housing. Our Minister of Finance. Uh, Madam Speaker, we, uh, we need to look at both categories, the people who have mortgages, of course, also the people who are renting. For those people that have mortgages, the reason that we work together with the CMHC to create the appropriate capacity for the banking sector to defer mortgages was because we recognized that this was exactly the challenge. I know that the banks are experiencing large volumes, and that is a challenge that we are all facing, uh, but I also know that they will be able to defer mortgages. With respect to rents, we continue to work on this challenge. Uh, of course, one of the main features of our emergency benefit is to get money into people's hands as rapidly as possible. Additionally, not having them have to pay taxes now means they can defer those if they have them so that they can have more access to funding. L'honorable député de Joliette. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Au Québec, on est fiers de notre industrie aérospatiale. Or, avec le quasi-arrêt de l'industrie de l'aviation qui vit, euh, elle aussi, des moments terribles, euh, on sait que ça va donner un dur coup à nos entreprises au Québec puis à travers le Canada, puis aux dizaines de milliers d'emplois. Par exemple, on vient d'apprendre plus tôt dans la journée, hein, ça remonte à quand même plusieurs heures, rendu à cette heure-ci, euh, que Bombardier annonce l'arrêt du travail au sein de ses installations pour au moins un mois. Hein, il y a évidemment euh, les problèmes sanitaires là, avec le COVID-19, mais aussi l'industrie vit des problèmes avec les, au niveau de la chaîne d'approvisionnement, les délais, les restrictions. Au niveau des contrats, hein, il y a évidemment un ralentissement. Au niveau de la livraison, avec les restrictions de voyage, euh, quand on regarde ce qui se fait en Europe, aux États-Unis, on voit que l'aérospatial jouit d'un statut particulier. Donc, ma question pour euh, le gouvernement, c'est à savoir si, vous reconnaissez, si euh, le gouvernement reconnaît que l'aérospatial est une industrie stratégique et que, conséquemment, euh, le gouvernement pourrait déployer des mesures nécessaires pour la soutenir. Merci, Madame la Présidente. L'honorable ministre des Finances. Madame, euh, Madame le Président, nous savons qu'on va avoir des secteurs dans une situation très difficile avec le COVID-19. Et bien sûr, le, le secteur aérospatial est un des secteurs qui va être dans une, dans une situation avec moins de revenus, avec les défis très importants. Nous, euh, nous allons travailler avec, avec les secteurs 
pour assurer qu'ils peuvent avoir l'accès aux fonds nécessaires pour, euh, pour le temps quand on a le problème. Et euh, ça, c'est euh, sûrement le cas pour le secteur aérospatial. L'honorable député de Joliette. Oui, je tiens à remercier le ministre des Finances pour sa réponse, très appréciée. Mais euh, ma prochaine question porte sur le secteur de l'agriculture. Euh, ce qu'on entend, c'est que, nos oui, il y a eu des mesures euh, de mise en place, mais nos agriculteurs demandent euh, de bonifier agri-investissement de 5 sans contrepartie des entreprises, ce qui permettrait de fournir les liquidités sans s'endetter. Est-ce que le gouvernement s'engage en ce sens-là? Et euh, j'ajouterais, euh, si on revient à l'annonce de lundi de Financement agricole Canada, je rappellerai au gouvernement qu'au Québec, seulement 30 des fermes euh, ils sont inscrites à Financement agricole Canada, euh, qui, euh, sur le terrain, n'a pas le personnel pour répondre à tout le monde. Euh, donc, qu'est-ce que le gouvernement compterait faire à ce sujet-ci? L'honorable ministre des Finances. Président, nous savons que le secteur agriculteur est, est très important, bien sûr, et euh, les défis vont être euh, importants avec, avec le COVID-19. C'est pour ça que nous avons changé les niveaux de, de possibilités de faire des, euh, des hypothèques, de faire des, euh, des prêts euh, avec le Farm Credit Canada. Ça, c'est quelque chose de très important. Nous allons continuer de travailler avec les, les, les fermiers et bien sûr, euh, s'il y a des choses qu'on doit faire pour assurer que nous sommes dans une bonne position, nous allons les considérer. L'honorable député de Joliette. Oui, j'aimerais d'abord euh, vous demander, Madame la Présidente, le temps qui me resterait. Plus qu'une minute et demie. Euh, c'est généreux. Merci. Euh, je, oui, je, je vais parler très, très, très lentement. J'avais prévu partager mon temps, mais finalement, je vais utiliser tout mon temps, Madame la, la Présidente. J'aimerais euh, avoir une précision euh, concernant les prestations pour les travailleurs autonomes. Si un travailleur autonome n'a plus de revenus, il a accès au paiement euh, de prestations spéciales, mais qu'en est-il si ses revenus chutaient de 80 par exemple? Est-ce que ce travailleur autonome-là pourrait se qualifier pour recevoir les prestations fiscales? Merci, Madame la Présidente. L'honorable ministre des Finances. Madame la Présidente, c'est une question importante, je sais. Nous avons décidé que c'est très important d'avoir une attestation assez simple pour assurer que nous pouvons avoir l'argent aussitôt que possible. C'est pour ça que nous avons choisi deux méthodes. Si quelqu'un a eu 5 000 de revenus pendant les derniers 12 mois, s'ils si sont maintenant dans une situation où ils n'ont aucun revenu. Donc, ça, c'est les deux, les deux mesures qui, qui vont être là. Et de cette façon, ils peuvent avoir accès aux bénéfices. Euh, je sais qu'il y a des autres mesures qui vont aider les gens sans, euh, avec une, moins de revenus, comme l'augmentation de l'allocation canadienne des enfants, comme l'augmentation de la GST, Low Income Credit. Et euh, quand même, euh, nous avons une situation où tout le monde, les, les compagnies, les individus, peuvent euh, avoir une situation où ils ne, ne doivent pas payer leur, leurs impôts jusqu'au le 31 août. L'honorable député de mécantic Merci, Madame la Présidente. Madame la Présidente, les citoyens de partout sont inquiets. Ils perdent leur emploi. Ils ont besoin d'un signal clair qu'ils vont avoir accès rapidement à l'aide promise. On sait que 80 des Canadiens sont à 200 dollars par mois de ne pas arriver. Le gouvernement doit couper la paperasse, livrer les chèques aux citoyens. On fera la chasse aux fraudeurs plus tard s'il y a lieu, Madame la Présidente. Il y a d'autres urgences en ce moment. Quand l'aide d'urgence, de soutien d'urgence, va-t-elle arriver dans les poches des Canadiens qui en ont besoin? L'honorable ministre des Finances. Madame la Présidente, c'est exactement notre but d'avoir un processus qui est très simple, très efficace, d'avoir la possibilité d'avoir argent dans les poches des gens qui sont dans une situation difficile aussitôt que possible. C'est pour ça que nous avons trouvé une solution qui va être, comme nous avons dit, efficace. Et de cette façon, pendant les prochaines deux ou trois semaines, mais, mais j'espère deux, on va avoir la possibilité d'avoir argent pour les gens qui sont dans une situation sans revenu à cause du COVID-19. L'honorable député de Bégaticlera. Est-ce que la date du 6 avril qui a été annoncée par le premier ministre du Québec est réaliste? L'honorable ministre des Finances. Madame la Présidente, je veux être très clair. Nous travaillons chaque journée pour assurer que le grand nombre des gens qui sont dans une situation difficile vont avoir accès aux gens. Nous travaillons chaque jour pour assurer la date et quand nous avons une date exacte, je vais le dire. 
Madame la députée de Mégantic-Léran. Madame la Présidente, j'ai reçu ce message-là il y a deux heures d'un entrepreneur. Je ne dors pas. Nous avons 450 mises à pied à faire et un autre 100 au début de la semaine prochaine. Sérieusement, j'ai des questions sur l'aide financière que nous allons apporter à nos employés au cours des deux à trois prochaines semaines pour l'attente des premiers chèques et personne ne me répond. Est-ce que quelqu'un peut répondre à cet employeur-là et lui dire qu'est-ce qu'on va faire et est-ce qu'on va maintenir la semaine d'attente pour les employeurs et les employés qui vont avoir besoin d'argent rapidement? L'honorable ministre des Finances. Dis donc, si le membre voudrait euh, envoyer le, le, la question, je vais avoir quelque chose, quelqu'un dans mon équipe euh, qui va répondre aux questions directement. L'honorable député de mécanique clérable Madame la Présidente, le gouvernement du Québec fait un excellent travail dans la gestion de la crise, affirme que 200 projets d'infrastructures qui attendent une approbation fédérale, le même nombre pour le gouvernement de l'Ontario. Le ministre des Finances s'engage-t-il à approuver ces projets d'ici 15 jours pour faire en sorte qu'on puisse mettre les gens au travail quand on peut le faire? L'honorable ministre des Finances. Madame la Présidente, dans une situation euh, une, euh, une, où on a des choses très importantes à faire immédiatement. C'est ça que nous considérons aujourd'hui. Bien sûr, nous avons des autres choses qu'on qu doit faire là, prochainement et ça doit être considéré quand on a le, le, la possibilité de considérer les, les défis dans les prochaines semaines, les prochains mois. Honorable député de mégantic -Lérabe. Madame la Présidente, au ministre des Affaires internationales, que fait le gouvernement pour s'assurer que les travailleurs étrangers temporaires approuvés, les travailleurs agricoles saisonniers des pays qui ont fermé leurs propres frontières, pourront venir au Canada pour aider à la récolte de cette année? Il faut nourrir les gens chez nous, Madame la Présidente. C'est important qu'on puisse avoir les ressources humaines pour le faire. Honorable ministre des Affaires étrangères. Madame la Présidente, dans une crise comme celle-là, c'est important d'assurer d'abord la sécurité sanitaire des Canadiens, comme le ministre des Finances le faisait la sécurité économique, mais bien évidemment la sécurité alimentaire de tous les Canadiens. Donc, je vais travailler avec ma collègue, la ministre de l'Agriculture, pour s'assurer que les pays hôtes de ces travailleurs-là étrangers puissent les laisser partir pour, ce qui, pour, ce qui, pour que ces gens-là puissent venir aider, évidemment, nos agriculteurs ici au pays. Merci, Mme. Madame. Madame la députée, les mecs indéclarables. Merci, au ministre des Finances. Est-ce que le gouvernement a envisagé permettre aux citoyens de retirer leur REER sans payer d'impôts selon la formule d'achat d'une première propriété? pour leur permettre d'avoir accès à du capital rapidement. Ils pourraient le rembourser sur 10 ans, mais ça donnerait des moyens à des familles qui en ont besoin. Dans la ministre des Finances. Monsieur le Président, nous avons euh, décidé de faire des choses qui vont aider les gens immédiatement, avec, avec un bénéfice qui va aider les gens qui, qui ont rien comme revenu à cause de COVID-19. Euh, bien sûr, nous allons considérer les autres approches, mais maintenant, nous pensons que nous avons trouvé une approche qui va considérer le défi dans une façon efficace et avec euh, le moins de temps pour assurer les gens qu'ils vont avoir de l'argent. Donc, c'est ça notre approche. Et euh, si on a des autres idées, on va considérer dans les prochains jours et semaines. Uh, it being 4.30 a.m., pursuant to an order made, I know, it sounds weird, pursuant to an order made earlier today, the committee will rise. Order. Uh, pursuant to an order made earlier today, the House will now proceed to the consideration of Bill C-13, an act respecting certain measures in response to COVID-19. Monsieur Morneau, appuyé par Madame Haidou, uh, propose que le projet de loi C-13, loi concernant certaines mesures en réponse à la COVID-19, soit maintenant le une deuxième fois et renvoyé à une comité plénière. Pursuant to an order made earlier today, uh, a member of each recognized party and a member of the Green Party may speak to the motion for not more than 10 minutes. This will be followed by a period of five minutes for questions and comments. Members are permitted to split their time with another member. Debate, the Honorable Minister, the Honorable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. COVID-19 is a challenge unlike any we've ever faced. 
Canadians are worried about their health and the health of their loved ones. I understand what people are going through in one sense. Two of my own loved ones are facing this disease right now. One of my sisters who lives in Europe and a godson in the United States. They're both doing well and I know they get through this, but it's a reminder once again of how this disease is impacting so many people. We're all in this together. Canadians are worried about the economic impacts as well, keeping a roof over their heads and putting food on their table. <clears throat> While we don't yet know the full economic impacts, I want to tell Canadians that our government is prepared to do whatever it takes to mitigate the impacts. La semaine dernière, notre gouvernement a annoncé d'importantes mesures économiques pour soutenir les Canadiens et s'assurer que personne n'est laissé pour compte. Grâce à ce projet de loi déposé aujourd'hui au Parlement, nous prenons les prochaines mesures pour mettre en œuvre notre plan de protection des Canadiens et de l'économie canadienne pendant cette période d'incertitude. This legislation aims to provide timely support to Canadians and make sure we all have the tools necessary to support them, as well as businesses, as things continue to rapidly evolve in these very uncertain times. Mr. Speaker, First, I'd like to outline how this will help Canadians worried about their health and their ability to pay the bills. Notre priorité consists à protéger la santé des Canadiens. Le projet de loi confère à la ministre de la Santé et moi le pouvoir de demander des fonds pour appuyer les efforts du gouvernement fédéral visant à prévenir et à contrôler la propagation de la COVID-19. This legislation pro proposes to provide one-time funding the $500 million through the Canada Health Transfer for provinces and territories to ensure our health care systems across the country have the resources they need. My colleague, the Minister of Health, has been in constant communication with her colleagues. We're in this together, and we must continue to work together. This means ensuring that our health care systems have the funds they need to treat patients and to continue to deliver world-class care. We also know that many Canadians don't have access to benefits when they're sick. No Canadian should have to choose between buying groceries and taking care of their health. It's not good for them or for our communities. We're proposing the new Canada Emergency Response Benefit. It's a simpler and more accessible version of the previous two benefits, the Emergency Care Benefit and Emergency Support Benefit. We want to ensure that all Canadians who can't work because of COVID-19 and don't have access to paid leave or other income support get the support they need in a simple and rapid way. This approach supports any Canadian who finds themselves in a situation in which they lose all of their income due to COVID-19 and supports every Canadian business by protecting every employee. It's a wage subsidy delivered directly to people. Canadian workers who are sick, are self-isolating or quarantined, looking after a sick family member, or who have been furloughed or terminated because of COVID-19 will be eligible. This includes workers who are still employed but aren't receiving income because of work disruptions related to COVID-19. This will help businesses keep their employees as they navigate these difficult times and make sure they can quickly resume operations when the time is right. It also supports working parents who have to stay home with their children without pay because schools and daycares are closed. For workers eligible for employment insurance sickness benefits, we're also proposing to waive the requirement for claimants to provide a medical certificate. For low and modest income Canadians, we're proposing a special top-up through the GST credit by early May. This will double maximum GST credit payment amounts. On average, for those benefiting, this measure will put an additional almost $400 more in the pockets of single individuals and $600 for couples. Pour les familles avec enfants, notre gouvernement propose d'augmenter temporairement les paiements de l'allocation canadienne pour enfants. Les parents profiteront d'un supplément de 300 dollars par enfant dès le mois de mai. Notre gouvernement propose une moratoire de six mois sans intérêt sur le remboursement des prêts d'études canadiennes pour tous ceux que effectuant actuellement en remboursant. Cela signifie que près d'un million de Canadiens déposeront une somme supplémentaire de 160 dollars par mois pendant toute cette période. Canadians who owe personal income taxes and Canadian businesses who owe corporate income tax will not be required to pay it until August 31st. 
This frees up $55 billion and keeps that money circulating in the economy. We need to help our businesses weather the storm, keep Canadians employed, and make sure Canada's economy remains strong and stable. On top of our direct support to people, which will benefit every business that must furlough employees to maintain operations, this legislation proposes a wage subsidy for small organizations for them to help Canadians working. We also understand that businesses may require more liquidity during this time, so we're leveraging the Business Development Bank of Canada and Export Development Canada to work with private sector lenders to coordinate financing solutions for Canadian businesses. These are highly capitalized and well positioned to respond. With this legislation, we are making amendments that would give us the necessary flexibility to help businesses through EDC and BDC. These changes will also allow BDC to provide more financial support to Canadian businesses and give EDC the flexibility to deliver financial and credit insurance support to affected Canadian companies. This important legislation would provide these two institutions with additional resources to respond to the needs of businesses as necessary. We know that access to financing is crucial right now for businesses across the country. En plus de ces modifications, le gouvernement a mis sur pied un programme de crédit aux entreprises. Dans le cadre de ce programme, la Banque du Développement du Canada et Exportation et Développement Canada renforceront leur coopération avec les institutions du secteur privé pour coordonner des solutions de financement pour les entreprises canadiennes. Ce programme serait particulièrement pertinent pour les entreprises du secteur qui sont confrontées à des défis imposants à court terme, comme le tourisme et le secteur pétrolier et gazier. Monsieur le Président, dans le cadre de ce programme, les sociétés d'État mettront plus de 10 milliards de dollars à la disposition des entreprises de toute taille qui éprouvent des difficultés de crédit sous la forme de soutien supplémentaire. The Canada Account is an important tool that can support Canadian companies with financing and guarantees. With the potential economic impact of COVID-19, there could be an increased demand for Canada Account financing. We're proposing to strengthen our ability to act through the Canada Account. We also recognize that farmers in the agri-food sector will need access to financing. We're proposing to strengthen Farm Credit Canada to support the sector during these times. Mr. Speaker, the government is also taking action to help the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation increase liquidity in the financial sector by providing stable funding to banks and mortgage lenders to support continued lending to Canadian businesses and individuals. This work is absolutely critical. To this end, the government is launching an insured mortgage purchase program to purchase up to $50 billion of insured mortgage pools through CMHC. The proposed actions announced today represent direct support to Canadians and to Canadian businesses to help protect jobs and ensure Canadians have the money they need during this challenging time. Monsieur le Président, il convient de noter que le Canada est très bien placé pour faire des investissements. For the meilleur bilan dans, dans des pays de G7, the Canada has the capacity financière to soutenir its economy tout au long de cette période difficile. By working together, we can face up to this global health and economic crisis from a position of strength, give confidence to markets, and help Canadians receive the support they need to weather the crisis. I'm asking my honourable colleagues from all parties to support this legislation. There can be no delay. I'm confident that all parliamentarians will rise to the occasion. Canadians are counting on us. Before we uh, go to questions and comments, we're just going to pause momentarily to uh, switch up uh, personnel on the console. To get everything wiped down and ready to go for the next, the next operator. Okay, good. Questions and comments. Kessin Kamantar, the Honourable Opposition House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, Minister of Finance for his comments. And if I could take off my partisan hat for just a moment, I think uh, we all recognize what a difficult time this is, obviously, for, for the country, for the world, and uh, for the Canadian government. Of, of any political stripe, this is a very heavy load to bear. And I'm glad that we, uh, we can be here together, not always agreeing, but agreeing on one thing, and that is that we are putting the needs of, uh, of our fellow Canadians first and foremost. Um, Mr. Speaker, my question has to do with small businesses. And they seem to uh, have been 
neglected in, in the, the finance minister's bill. Small businesses, the backbones of our communities, whether it's uh, small restaurants, coffee shops, nail salons, uh, they, these are folks who employ one, two, three people and they have been uh, neglected. And I would like to ask the Minister of Finance what they're going to do to help small businesses right now who need some support. Thank you. Our Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is a very important question. In fact, we are trying to make sure that we support small businesses through this very challenging time. We know that for uh, many, if not most small businesses, they are employers. Uh, they may be sole proprietors, but they may be employers. And that's why we're delivering a wage subsidy directly to their employees if their employees are unable to work as a result of COVID-19. We know that that supports their ability to maintain that employment as we come out of this. That's critically important. For those employees that they do keep working, they will have a wage subsidy, a 10% wage subsidy. And of course, we're making sure that they don't have any need to pay their taxes through and until August 31st. We remain open to consider additional measures because this is a very dynamic situation, and that is something that we continue to work on to make sure that we're supporting people during this challenging time. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I do appreciate uh, having the opportunity to discuss this bill and debate it in the House today, uh, even at a later period of time. Um, I would like to, to echo some of the comments from my, my colleague just now and ask uh, the Minister about small businesses. I know that I've heard from so many in, in the riding uh, that I represent in London Fanshawe and they're telling me that that 10% wage subsidy is simply not enough. So um, knowing what, what small business owners put into their, their businesses, it's their dreams, it, it's everything that they have in many cases. Uh, they want to save their employees, they, they don't want to have to lay them off. So will the government government at this time consider um, the 75 percent at least wage subsidy that uh, our party has introduced. Well, Minister of Finance. I want to uh, be very clear that for, for any employee that is, that is not able to get revenue as a result of COVID-19 in these small businesses, that employee will be getting direct support, which is, which is a wage subsidy direct, directly delivered to the employee. For those employees that are still there, of course, uh, that's important too. And we're trying to ensure that that is uh, something that employers have the capacity to, to manage through. And that's the reason we've been working so hard to make sure that Business Development Bank of Canada and Export Development Bank have access to capital and that they can deliver through the business credit availability program that access through the current banking relationship that the small business has. We know that these measures in tandem will support people through a difficult time. And as I mentioned, we are going to continue to think about ways that we can support Canadians, uh, people who are off work, businesses through this challenging time. Time for a short question. The Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I too want to echo my sentiments that uh, um, you know these are very trying times and it's uh, very uh, reassuring to see this House come together, all parties uh, uh, um, um, working collaboratively together. There's no doubt, Mr. Speaker, that right now out there, there's a lot of anxiety and worry. And the minister has uh, mentioned a number of things, uh, individual items uh, that he's proposing in this legislation. I would like to ask him more broadly, what is his message to people out there, to small business owners, to individuals who are feeling that anxiety right now? What is the message that he wants to deliver them to them uh, coming from the government? Honorable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, first and foremost, the message I want to get out to Canadians, to Canadian businesses, is that we have a, a, a strong and resilient country. We have a, a tremendous starting point. Our health system is strong. Our financial situation is, is strong. We have a banking system that's literally the best in the world. These are important assets as we face a challenging time. What I want to say, though, is the, the reason that it's so important to have a strong financial position as a country is it means that in a difficult time like the one we're facing right now, we have the capacity to act and to continue to act because that financial capacity allows us to face up to the challenges today and the continuing challenges that we will have to face together. 
So what we've done is we've put forward measures that are obviously a very, very significant. $55 billion in tax deferrals, direct support to individuals and support to businesses. And we will continue to think about additional measures that we can take as we face this. We don't know the severity of this situation. We don't know the duration. And that's why we're maintaining our ability to address a dynamic situation with dynamic measures. Our approach, we know, will get us through this, that will help Canadians to bridge this time to a better future. Reprise de débat, uh, l'enlève chef d'opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that I speak for uh, all parliamentarians when I say that those Canadians who are affected uh, by the COVID-19 virus are in our thoughts and prayers at this time. And I know that our actions, whether on the government side of the House or on opposition benches, must continue to be guided uh, by our shared desire to protect the health and safety of all Canadians and to support them through the global pandemic. These are unprecedented times warranting an unprecedented response, both from governments and from the Canadian people. Nous savons que cette crise touche la vie de Canadiennes et de Canadiens partout au pays. Almost a million workers have already been laid off. Stores and restaurants have been told to close their doors, and Canadians have been asked to stay at home. Nous savons aussi que cette crise frappe notre économie et que les mois à venir seront très difficile. And while we are all aware that more needs to be done, and we have all heard of isolated in incidents of people not following public health advice, overwhelmingly Canadians have risen to the challenge and shown the kind of care and compassion that we as a country are so well known for. Mr. Speaker, in these trying times, now more than ever, we see the strength of our communities and appreciate our true Canadian heroes. Truck drivers, farmers, factory workers, keeping our supply chain running at all times, companies stepping up, ensuring that workers get paid even if their doors are closed, grocery stores, pharmacies, and cleaning staff working to keep shelves open, uh, keep shelves full and doors open, restaurants offering takeout and delivery to those who need a hot meal, and perhaps most importantly, as we consider the health crisis, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to the doctors, nurses, hospital staff, public health officials, and first responders working around the clock to keep us all healthy and safe. I had an opportunity to speak with the President of the Ontario Medical Association last week about what doctors who are urgently fighting this pandemic need from the government. Now, those needs must be met. Uh, the President mentioned the need for greater information sharing tools so that tracking cases can be done more quickly, uh, so that once someone uh, is uh, tested, posit has a positive test result, that the medical and, and health agencies can work back and find out who they were in contact with and do that in a much, more, a much faster response mechanism. He also spoke to the need for equipment that must be procured now. Uh, before the number of cases escalate. So I hope the government takes those concerns very seriously. Our researchers and scientific community will also play an, es an essential role in fighting this pandemic and ultimately developing a vaccine. Je tiens également à saluer le leadership démontré par les élus au niveau provincial et municipal dans tout le pays. Pendant que le gouvernement fédéral a été lent à agir, les provinces ont agi rapidement. Profitant des pouvoirs conférés par la Constitution, la santé, l'éducation, la police et les services locaux, cela a permis à chaque province de relever ses propres défis et de proposer des approches nouvelles et innovantes. Canadians are worried. They're worried for their health and the health of their loved ones, for their jobs and for their futures. And they are looking to us for action. Now, Conservatives have been flexible in our approach while also continuing to ensure government oversight. When we agreed to the extraordinary suspension of Parliament, Conservatives insisted that the government be subject to substantial accountability measures, including that the Auditor, Auditor General would, would audit any new spending and that parliamentary committees would be able to review all of that spending when Parliament resumes. We also agreed to bring back the House of Commons this week with only a small number of members present. 
we were prepared to quickly pass the measures that the Prime Minister had announced to date. What we were not prepared for was the government's attempted undemocratic power grab. Now, the Liberals shamefully tried to use a public health crisis to give themselves the powers to raise taxes, debt and spending without parliamentary oversight. But after hours of negotiation, the government now has backed down from that position and Conservatives have secured the following concessions. We demanded that the government remove the section that would have allowed them to raise taxes without parliamentary approval, and they have agreed. We demanded that the government walk back their unlimited spending powers and that special warrants expire on June 23, 2020, instead of September 30, 2020, and they agreed. We demanded that the government include explicit reference to putting taxpayers' rights first, and they agreed. We demanded that the government must put sunset clauses in their legislation, something that the Conservative uh, Party were the only ones raising. C'est nous qui ont demandé que nous devons avoir les clauses de sunset clause uh, c est, c est, uh, pour assurer que les nouveaux pouvoirs ne sont pas là pour uh, les années et les années. Uh, we demand that the government be accountable to Parliament through regular reports to the House of Commons Health and Finance Committees and that the Finance Committee have the right to recall Parliament if we identify any abuses, and they agreed. Our effective opposition has also got the government to reverse course on other policies. Remember, it was just a short while ago in this House that Conservatives were calling for stronger action to protect our borders. We were the ones that were asking the tough questions as to why flights coming into Canada from hot spots around the world were continuing to be allowed. We proposed the idea of restricting travel much earlier. The government's initial response was that closing borders and restricting travel was not an effective way to fight this virus. Well, Mr. Speaker, it turns out that's exactly what they were forced to do just a short while after making those statements. We asked about the impact of the border closure on the temporary foreign worker and seasonal agricultural worker programs, and the government made ex exemptions. Nous avons exigé que le gouvernement stoppe les passages illégaux à la frontière, en particulier au chemin Roxham, et c'est seulement grâce à nous que le gouvernement a écouté. We have also called on the federal government to increase support for small businesses and workers, and I remain hopeful that the government will implement our suggestions. So Conservatives are focused on putting forward constructive solutions to ensure that no one falls through the cracks. We will also continue to ask questions on behalf of Canadians and ensure that the government's response includes clear timelines so that Canadians know when they can expect to start receiving support. And many of us are looking at models around the world and we hope that the government can look to countries that had effective measures on the front end and who were then able to relax some of the restrictions on the economy much more quickly. And we, I, I know it was already mentioned uh, by one of my honourable colleagues, the examples that we can look to in Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan, where a large number of tests being done, rapid information sharing, and tracking of individuals who had, uh, had tested positive so that they could identify who in the community were exposed. Those are some of the measures that we need to see implemented much more quickly so we can quickly get to the point where our, our economy can get back on its feet. And while the government is looking for ways to do exactly that, I again want to urge them to do everything that they can. I know the, the Finance Minister earlier said that the Bank of Canada uh, is independent of government and while, uh, and, and while that is true to, to many degrees, there are ways that the government can take steps to ensure that quantitative easing is not an option that they are looking at. Uh, every time that has been pa uh, tried in the past, uh, it has led to uh, many negative consequences for years longer than the economic crisis uh, that uh, justified those moves. Uh, we know that there's a huge crunch right now in the credit markets, and we know the government will be looking to ways to address that, but uh, simply printing more money is not the way to do it. Uh, so I, I hope that they take that into account. We are here to be cooperative as they look to providing support to individuals, as they look to help people pay their mortgages, pay their rent, pay their utilities and put food on the table. Nous serons là pour assister, pour proposer les solutions qui peuvent assurer que les, 
les Canadiens et Canadiens pour rester dans leur maison, pour, pour garder le, leur maison. Et euh, nous, euh, nous allons coopérer avec euh, les mesures qui donnent l'aide directement dans les mains des Canadiens qui sont affectés par cette crise. So I want to thank all my colleagues for being here throughout the day. I just again remind the government that the assistance part of this legislation could have been passed uh, 12 hours ago. Uh, but uh, we will acknowledge the progress that has been made and the spirit of cooperation that I see the uh, Honourable Government House Leader there. I want to thank him for uh, all his efforts uh, this uh, throughout the day. It's been uh, uh, a lot of hard work and a lot of moving pieces in, in a lot of ways. And for those of us who are still here, who started the day, who are <laughs> still here, uh, we are grateful that this assistance will be able to flow to the hands of Canadians. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Questions and comments. Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his uh, comments today. And indeed, again, that cooperation that we're seeing throughout the House, uh, I think it uh, truly is remarkable. I, you know, I, I, I would suggest, uh, um, per perhaps uh, slightly uh, in contrast to some of his, his comments, that what we saw was the government bring forward a plan, uh, a plan that the government thought was in the best interest of Canadians. Um, I realize that the opposition had some uh, issues with some of that stuff. And they, they, they made that known, Mr. Speaker. They made that known, and I, th I think that that was really important. And I think that what we should um, take from this is that uh, in a time like this, uh, even with the circumstances that we're in, democracy works that the opposition can do their job, that the opposition can push back on the government, that we can come to compromise, and that we can move forward based on that. So I do appreciate that. The, the, the member, the leader of the opposition, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, earlier on uh, uh, in the, the debate today mentioned, uh, um, the, he questioned the 10% uh, subsidy that was going to be given to uh, small businesses uh, for their employers specifically. He actually suggested that maybe that should be increased uh, slightly. I'm wondering if he can expand on that and uh, suggest uh, where he th sees that going. Leader of the Opposition. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I just want to clarify something. It's not the fact that Conservatives had uh, issues with what the government proposed, uh, uh, grabbing for itself unprecedented powers. Canadians had a massive here, problem here. with what the government proposed. And while we may uh, uh, be thankful that we've arrived at a place where we can allow this legislation uh, to go through, I would suggest the Honourable Member to do everything he can with his colleagues to say uh, that there was a tremendous amount of goodwill throughout the last few weeks. And if the government had proposals, if, if they had ideas of how they would like to have greater flexibility to address this crisis as it unfolds, uh, to, to do so through the normal channels of conversation that had already been established is far preferable uh, than surprising uh, the opposition in uh, the, sh the short amount of time that we had uh, before house, the House was coming back. So I just leave that with him. I hope he can take that message back uh, to the rest. J'aimerais toutefois lui rappeler que s'en prendre deux fois à quelques dizaines de minutes là, à l'indépendance de la Banque du Canada, ce n'est pas un bon message envoyé au marché du tout. Aussi, euh, j'aimerais lui rappeler, il parlait par exemple de son intervention au niveau du chemin Roxham, mais non, il n'y a pas seulement eu le Parti conservateur qui est intervenu là-dessus, le Bloc depuis le début tient cette ligne-là. Même chose pour les négociations là, pour arriver à ce projet de loi-ci. Et lorsque moi je compare la version qu'on avait ce matin et celle qu'on a euh, 12 heures plus tard, il y a des différences, mais elles ne sont euh, pas si importantes que ça. Je, donne, je, donne, je donnerai un exemple. Le, le chef du Parti conservateur parle du 31 décembre 2021 au euh, 30 septembre euh, 2020, le, à la fin de l'été qui vient. C'était déjà dans la version de ce matin. Est-ce que l'éléphant a accouché d'une souris ou plutôt le tigre géant s'est transformé en chaton docile? Merci, M. le Président. La chef d'opposition. Et M. le Président, le député n'a aucune raison. Euh, son chef a quitté les négociations. Elle a donné la permission au gouvernement de faire n'importe quoi. Elle a quitté. Elle a peut-être euh, à, à, à faim décidé d'avoir soupé euh, au lieu de euh, représenter son caucus, représenter les intérêts de, ce, de, de, de ses électeurs. Mais nous avons fait un autre choix. Nous avons décidé de rester ici pour assurer que nous avons un meilleur projet de loi pour les Canadiens, Monsieur le Président. Et il y a beaucoup de différences entre... Okay. Sorry. 
I thought. Okay, time for uh, questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we all acknowledge that the COVID-19 crisis is going to put a lot of Canadians into a difficult position, particularly when it comes to their housing. Now, the government suggested that voluntary measures on the part of banks to defer mortgages is good enough. Uh, do you agree with the government that that's going to be good enough? What we believe is that we need to go further and mandate uh, that mortgages are paused and that there's a break on rent to ensure that people are not evicted during this crisis. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, we certainly agree with the objective of what the Honourable Member is talking about. Uh, what I believe is the best course of action now is we are talking about unprecedented involvement in many aspects of the economy that the government has never uh, tried before, even the most ambitious uh, previous Liberal governments that would have loved to have had more control over the economy have, have, have not. We are facing a situation where they're very well may need to be uh, short-term uh, solutions to keep people in their homes. Uh, we do agree with the objective. I think now is the time to have our, our colleagues on the Finance Committee look at some of the tools that we might want to look at that can provide that short-term benefit that allows the government to get in to help people through this crisis and then get out so that we can return to a normal uh, functioning economy. À la prise de débat, uh, député de Joliet. Oui, merci, Monsieur le Président. Euh, on est, euh, malgré l'heure euh, qu'indique l'horloge, euh, la Chambre vit actuellement un moment euh, très important. On vit une crise euh, sanitaire sans précédent, une crise que je n'aurais jamais cru euh, vivre dans ma vie. C'est une pandémie à l'échelle mondiale et euh, une situation extrême de la sorte exige des mesures extrêmes et c'est ce dont il est discuté euh, aujourd'hui. Premièrement, Monsieur le Président, euh, j'aimerais saluer euh, l'approche euh, de face à cette crise-là euh, au niveau euh, mondial, qui est de faire passer la santé avant l'économie. Ben oui, l'économie c'est hyper important, mais là on se dit ce nouveau virus-là va, si rien n'est fait, va avoir des effets dévastateurs sur la santé, causer des mortalités incroyables. Et euh, moi, je salue le fait que, collectivement, on se dise on va faire preuve de solidarité pour passer à travers la crise puis minimiser le nombre de décès, faire passer la santé avant l'économie. Ça, je salue ça, puis le Bloc salue ça. Évidemment, ce choix-là, cette décision-là, ça prend du courage, puis il y a des conséquences économiques extrêmes. Hein? On, on pourra faire toutes les analyses une fois que l'épisode se sera terminé. Souhaitons qu'il se termine le plus rapidement possible. Et j'ai bon espoir que, une fois le problème du COVID-19 euh, encadré euh, et mis dans ses balises, euh, on va l'économie va reprendre euh, très rapidement. J'en suis convaincu. Mais d'ici là, ça prend des mesures. Ça prend des mesures de soutien, des mesures extrêmes. Il faut le laisser personne derrière. Il faut laisser euh, tomber personne. Il faut n'oublier personne. Et à ce sujet-là, je salue plusieurs des mesures dans le présent projet de loi. Hein, au niveau euh, des travailleuses, travailleurs, euh, on avait une inquiétude de ceux qui n'auraient pas suffisamment d'heures accumulées pour avoir accès à l'assurance-emploi. Bien, il y a quelque chose pour ces personnes-là. Euh, évidemment, toutes les personnes qui ont des ennuis de santé ou qui sont dans l'entourage de quelqu'un qui pourrait euh, avoir contracté le, le COVID ou qui est mis en quarantaine, bien, il y a des mesures pour ces personnes-là. C'est des mesures euh, euh, importantes. Même chose pour les travailleurs autonomes qui, euh, s'ils n'étaient pas inscrits au régime de l'assurance-emploi, euh, ils n'auront pas, pas accès. Donc, euh, là, ici, les personnes vont être couvertes. Donc, il y a beaucoup de mesures comme ça qui sont mises en place. Évidemment, la grande préoccupation de la population, euh, ce qu'on entend partout dans les médias, mais les téléphones qu'on reçoit à nos bureaux, c'est la question d'efficacité de, des délais. Les gens sont vraiment inquiets. Ils ont entendu aux nouvelles que euh, le, les mesures sont annoncées, mais le quand et le comment, et le comment opérationnaliser ça, ça, c'est plus complexe. Évidemment, avec un million de personnes qui font une demande d'assurance-emploi, c'est certain que les bureaux de Service Canada puis les lignes sont surchargés, mais je pense qu'on a vraiment le devoir, 
en s'élevant au-dessus de la partisanerie, là, tout le monde ensemble ici, de trouver euh, des façons d'améliorer le processus pour accroître l'information les, euh, les, et surtout les, les délais, euh, rassurer les gens et s'assurer qu'ils reçoivent le premier chèque le plus rapidement possible. Il y a aussi des mesures pour les entreprises. Euh, je pense évidemment là, aux, euh, aux lignes de crédit que peuvent fournir la Banque de développement du Canada, exportation et développement du Canada. C'est important. Aussi à l'entente avec euh, le système bancaire. Hein, J'espère de grâce que euh, le mouvement des jardins, qui est le prêteur hypothécaire le plus important au Québec, va être inclus dans euh, la, la, les ententes où, il, où le, le mouvement des jardins peut l'être, évidemment. C'est hyper important pour l'économie du Québec. Mais tout ça va permettre aux institutions financières d'assurer les liquidités et de prendre des ententes avec les entreprises et les gens qui auront des difficultés de paiement à court terme. Donc, six mois, souhaitons que ce soit suffisant. Si ce ne l'était pas, on pourra y revenir après avec une deuxième phase d'un autre plan. Évidemment, je suis inquiet pour des pans entiers de notre économie. Si on pense au secteur de l'agriculture, nos agriculteurs, nos agricultrices sont très inquiets. Il y a eu une mesure annoncée euh, lundi. Pour l'instant, ça semble être jugé insuffisant pour assurer euh, le, le, le milieu euh, de l'agriculture. Euh, on le sait, là, avec euh, l'anxiété la, généralisée actuelle, euh, nourrir la population, c'est le service primordial euh, avec la santé, évidemment. Donc, il faut s'assurer que euh, nos euh, entreprises agricoles puissent passer au travers sans problème. À ce sujet-là, on nous faisait la suggestion euh, de bonifier de... Euh, 5 agri-investissement sans contrepartie des entreprises hein, qui permettrait de fournir les liquidités sans euh, que ces entreprises-ci s'endettent. Tantôt, euh, dans le, le, le comité plénier, j'ai cru comprendre que ce n'était pas envisagé pour l'instant. Je relance la, la demande, évidemment, euh, au gouvernement. Euh, quand on pense au secteur important euh, de l'économie, si je prends ceux du Québec, évidemment, euh, qui m'intéresse particulièrement, on ne peut pas, euh, on peut pas euh, ne pas voir l'importance de l'industrie euh, de l'aérospatiale. J'ai été content tantôt de voir que le euh, ministre des Finances l'a reconnu comme une industrie stratégique, donc le gouvernement la reconnaît comme telle et s'envoie le message que le jour où euh, l'industrie sera en difficulté, bien, il pourra avoir des plans d'aide comme pour l'ensemble le, des industries euh, stratégiques. Donc, c'est vraiment important de laisser personne derrière, euh, rassurer la population, aller de l'avant. On est, on est dans une crise extrême. Une, ça amène une, une, une crise économique extrême aussi. Souhaitons qu'on en sorte le plus rapidement possible. Ça va amener une panoplie d'éventails d'outils nouveaux pour s'en sortir, mais on le sait, euh, les, euh, dans la crise économique, c'est le temps de soutenir les revenus. Ici, il y a aussi un recul euh, de l'offre hein, au niveau des entreprises. Elles ont besoin de soutien, elles vivent beaucoup de, de difficultés. Donc, euh, il faut continuer à innover euh, dans les solutions apportées pour qu'on euh, puisse en sortir euh, le, le plus rapidement possible. Et, Règle générale, souvent, les économistes vont dire « chaque crise doit être l'opportunité de façonner l'économie de demain ». Eh bien, souhaitons que euh, cette opportunité-là, lorsqu'on sortira de la crise, euh, soit soulevée pour euh, développer davantage, euh, aller plus rapidement dans l'économie de la transition euh, écologique. Donc, euh, évidemment, nos pensées vont avec euh, toutes les personnes qui sont touchées de près ou de loin par euh, cette pandémie. Et euh, je souhaite, là, encore une fois, la meilleure collaboration euh, en laissant la partisanerie de côté dans cette Chambre pour euh, sortir de cette crise. Monsieur le Président, je vous remercie. Merci. Merci. commentaire, dans la députée de Hall Elmer. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Puis j'aimerais remercier mon honorable collègue pour son discours. Je pense qu'on partage plusieurs valeurs ensemble et certainement, en tant que des députés québécois, c'est certain qu'on salue le travail de tous les professionnels de la santé, les gens qui travaillent très fort pour s'assurer la, la sécurité des, des Québécois et des Canadiens. Et moi, j'aimerais juste poser la question à mon honorable collègue de Joliette. Euh, il a dit dans son discours l'importance de mettre la santé bien avant les intérêts de l'économie. Et puis, j'aimerais lui offrir une chance. Et moi, je suis d'accord avec, avec son point de vue durant cette pandémie, euh, pandémie qui, est un, qui est vraiment un, un, un fléau sérieux 
euh, envers le, le monde. Puis j'aimerais lui offrir une opportunité pour euh, rentrer plus en pour approfondir ses, euh, son point de vue, ses valeurs dans cette question-là, l'importance, pourquoi c'est plus qu'une question économique, c'est vraiment une question de la, du bien-être euh, du Québec, du Canada, du monde. Dans la députée de Joliette. Merci, M. le Président. Je remercie mon collègue de Hall Aylmer, qui le représente, qui est mon député en cette Chambre lorsque j'habite à ma résidence secondaire dans sa circonscription. Ça me donne la chance de recevoir ces envois collectifs qui sont très instructifs. Donc, je, je remercie pour ces, ces commentaires. Je trouve que le qu'on puisse prendre soin des gens, des gens qui sont à risque, de dire collectivement, on va faire d'immenses sacrifices. Hein? Là, par exemple, au Québec, on a dit, on met l'économie sur pause pour une durée de trois semaines pour euh, ralentir la progression de la pandémie. C'est un choix collectif qu'on décide d'assumer ensemble. Puis le but de ça, c'est de sauver des vies au bout du compte, d'augmenter la qualité de vie, la qualité de la santé des gens, puis de sauver des vies. Et ça, à mon avis, c'est euh, au niveau des valeurs beaucoup plus important que euh, des valeurs monétaires, comme on pourrait dire. Puis ça, bien, quand la pandémie sera derrière nous, souhaitons qu'il y ait une relance rapide et qu'on puisse avoir la santé et l'argent comme on souhaite au jour de l'an. Merci, M. le Président. Qu'est-ce que c'est commentaire? Dans, dans la députée de Megan Tréclarable. Euh, mon collègue a parlé d'une chose très importante, de l'importance de laisser la partisanerie de côté quand on travaille euh, dans une cause comme celle qu'on a présentement, où on a travaillé très, très fort. On doit avouer, le, le, le leader de l'opposition a travaillé très, très fort avec le leader du gouvernement aujourd'hui dans le but d'améliorer un projet de loi pour faire en sorte que le projet de loi soit le meilleur possible pour répondre aux attentes des Canadiens et des Canadiennes dans les circonstances. On n'est pas d'accord avec tout, mais je pense qu'on a travaillé ensemble fort pour faire en sorte d'améliorer le projet de loi pour faire quelque chose de bien. Je ne comprends pas, euh, quand on dit de ne pas faire de partisanerie, ça ne veut pas dire d'abdiquer ses responsabilités. Pourquoi est-ce que le Bloc a abdiqué ses responsabilités en ne participant pas aux négociations, en étant absent de la tête des négociations? Les négociations de nos deux partis se sont terminées jusqu'à 2 heures du matin cette nuit, M. le Président. Le Bloc n'était pas là. Pourquoi? Dans la députée de Joliette. Merci, M. le Président. Nous autres, on avait négocié la veille. On était en contact constant avec le gouvernement. C'est nous, l'entente qu'il y avait ce matin, qui est assez semblable à celle qu'il y a ce soir, nous convenait. On se disait, oui, euh, il y a un, un moment de crise, il faut aller de l'avant, il y a une urgence. Nous, on pensait au monde qui sont sous le chômage, là, puis qui se demandent s'ils vont recevoir leur chèque. On voulait accélérer le processus, pas le retarder de 12 heures voir plus. Là, évidemment, ce qui bloquait, c'était au niveau du Parti conservateur. Fait qu'on s'est dit, euh, on a dit euh, à ce qu'ils se consultent entre eux et puis qu'on soit mis au courant des nouveaux changements. Puis quand il y a eu la dernière mouture, puis à chaque mouture, on était mis au courant, on a participé à la rencontre avec le ministre des Finances puis le leader à chaque étape pour, euh, pour être bien au courant et puis euh, pour donner notre aval. Donc, euh, on était là tout le temps, mais nous, on était prêts plus tôt. Puis euh, comme je le disais tantôt, euh, en tout cas, ça, pour moi, c'est un cas de, de partisanerie, avoir retardé de deux heures. Quand je regarde ce qu'il y a dans le projet de loi de ce soir versus celui de ce matin, pour 12 heures, avoir fait presque dé, dérailler là, cette journée euh, qui devait euh, se terminer beaucoup plus tôt, euh, je ne je, 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 je me, je me, je me prononcerai pas, mais euh, j'ai mon... Alors, euh, nous avons le temps juste pour une brève question. Dans la députée... The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I wanted to uh, ask the, the member, I've heard a lot from my constituents, specifically about the candidate post corporation and uh, the fact that they are not taking the proper steps to ensure the safety of their employees and their clients. Um, they're not uh, providing the protective equipment, not sanitizing depot buildings and vehicles. They're insisting letter carriers and mail service couriers enter businesses throughout their routes, visiting all of those people every single day. And uh, they're really quite concerned. I'm wondering if, if the, the honorable member has, has heard that from some of his constituents and if he agrees that the minister has responsibility to ensure the safety of Canada Post workers. Mm -hmm. Merci, Juliette. Merci, ma collègue, pour son excellente intervention. Euh, évidemment, là, la priorité, c'est la santé, la santé publique. Donc, oui, ça prend des mesures, y compris pour Post Canada, et il doit y avoir des euh, mesures mises en place 
pour tout ce qu'elle a nommé et le financement qui l'accompagne, parce qu'il ne faut pas que notre, euh, le service public essentiel devienne un vecteur de contamination. Il faut rassurer la population. Il faut que quand les gens vont prendre leur courrier ou les, euh, les, les travailleuses et travailleurs que je connais dans ce service soient sécurisés euh, au même niveau que le, les, les, les gens qui travaillent dans, dans le reste du public. Donc, euh, oui, tout à fait. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pre uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, I want to just uh, take this moment to acknowledge the depth of the crisis that our, that our country is facing and that the world is facing. The impacts of COVID-19 are gripping the world in a crisis and Canada has, has felt the impacts and will continue to feel those impacts. In, in this crisis though, there are many people we need to thank. And I just want to take a moment to thank first and foremost, the healthcare workers who are running towards the fire, who are putting themselves at risk to keep us healthy. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart on behalf of all New Democrats. But I also want to acknowledge that the healthcare workers who are putting themselves at risk have one clear ask of us, and we owe it to them to respond to this ask. They're saying, we are willing to put ourselves at risk, but we need you to do your part to prevent the spread of this illness, to take social distancing seriously, to prevent the spread of this illness by limiting contact with others, by staying at home, and by doing the basic things like washing hands thoroughly and avoiding touching one's face. We owe it to these workers to do that as a, at a minimum. I also want to take an opportunity to thank all the people who are keeping us fed, from the transportation, supply chains, to farmers, to grocery store workers. You are heroes. Thank you for keeping our communities fed. Merci aussi aux professionnels de la santé publique qui assurent la circulation de l'information et nous donnent des orientations fiables et pratique sur ce que nous pouvons faire pour assurer notre sécurité et celle des autres. Merci aux entreprises qui ont décidé d'aider dans cette crise. Les distilleries fabricants du désinfectant pour les mains, les fabricants de pièces automobiles euh, euh, qui s'efforcent de retourner leur chaîne de production pour fabriquer du matériel médical. And finally, I want to thank Canadians. In this moment of crisis, we've seen incredible acts of kindness, of compassion, and generosity. We often hear people talk about the world needing more Canada, but right now, Canada needs more Canada. The generosity that we've seen from neighbors who've stepped up to help those that they don't even know to ensure that they get groceries. The kindness between community members to lift each other up in a time when people are going through so much difficulty. I want to thank Canadians who have risen to the occasion during this crisis. Now, uh, we have seen some, some great work that's been done in, in Parliament. I want to acknowledge the Prime Minister, the ministers, all parliamentarians in this building, in this house, who have done so much work for the communities. I want to thank you. And I want to give a particular shout out to the House leaders and whips who've worked so tirelessly today to get us to this point where we're able to move forward with this legislation. Now, when the legislation or when the measures were first put forward, New Democrats made it clear that we would be supporting all measures to help out Canadians during these difficult times. And I, I want to acknowledge that uh, the, the government has shown that they're interested in helping Canadians. But if they truly want to help Canadians, we need to do more and we need to do it faster. There are some priorities that we've outlined that speak to the needs of Canadians. Right now, Canadians need money in their pocket immediately. They need to know that they'll have a job to get back to once this crisis is dealt with. And finally, and most importantly, Canadians need to know that they have a safe place to live and they're not at risk of losing their homes. So that's why we propose three things to deal with that. First and foremost, we need to make sure we send direct financial support to Canadians right away. And that's why we're calling for a universal basic income, sending 
$2,000 immediately to all Canadians and an additional $250 to, uh, for children. This is an immediate, direct financial support to Canadians who need it right now. And we can deal with those who uh, may not need this at the time of taxation and recoup that additional amount. Secondly, we've suggested that to ensure that Canadians have a job to return to, we need to augment the proposal around wage subsidies. The current proposal is 10%, and at 10%, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, have said that that is not enough to ensure that they can keep their workforce going. Right now, for a small business, it is crucial to maintain the workforce. The idea of rehiring and retraining would be devastating to a business. And that's why we're calling for the government to follow in line with other countries around the world who have increased that wage subsidy proposal to at least 75% or more. That's what we're asking this government to consider, to give small businesses some help. And finally, to help out businesses, to help out families, to help out people who are either in a business or at home, we need to ensure that there is a pause, there is a break on rent and mortgage. And we need to make sure there's a ban on evictions. People need to know that they can stay in their home and this is crucial. Non seulement nous devons faire parvenir de l'argent aux gens le plus rapidement, mais nous devons aussi faire tout ce qui est en notre pouvoir pour limiter les dépenses des, des gens en ce moment. Il existe des bonnes mesures pour aider à réduire la pression, suspendre les paiements des prêts étudiants et permettre aux particuliers et aux euh, entreprises de différer le paiement de leur impôt sur les revenus. What we need to do is make sure that people have money in their pockets and that we're limiting the money that's going out of their pockets as much as we can during this crisis. Uh, we look at the, the reality that we're faced with right now, and we look at the struggles that Canadians are faced with right now. And Canadians are being asked to make a very impossible choice. They've got to decide whether they should stay at home, but not know if they can afford to pay rent or put food on the table, or do they go to work and risk exposing themselves to an illness or exposing their loved ones to an illness? That is an impossible decision. And, and we know that this is an impossible decision because we hear the stories. I remember when I was at the bakery just a couple of days ago, and young workers there told me that they were afraid to go into work because they're worried every day they went to work about being exposed to the illness. But at the same time, they were afraid that their bakery might be shut down and they would lose their job and not be able to pay their bills. One of my colleagues told me that in her neighborhood, the longest lineups weren't for groceries, weren't in front of the grocery stores, but instead in front of the money lending, the payday money lending store, because they were struggling for access to money at this point. While people wait for the measures in this legislation to take place and to get that crucial funding, people are gonna turn to money where they can get it. And that often means credit card companies or low interest rate loans. Now, we have, we have a responsibility here to ensure that credit companies and payday lending companies are not able to exploit people in desperate times. We have an obligation to ensure that they are not charging these interest rates anymore. So I have also heard the finance minister talk about working with banks to ensure that there's mortgage deferrals. That's simply not working and that it's not good enough. We need to see a pause on mortgages. We need to see a pause on rent. We need to ensure that people can be in their home. It's more critical than ever to ensure people are able to stay in their home. It's not just a moral responsibility, it's also a public health responsibility to ensure that people remain in their homes. What, what better way, how can someone self-isolate if they don't have a home? If we don't take measures right now to ensure people are not struggling with keeping their homes, if we don't freeze rents or put a pause on rents and mortgages, we're not just gonna have a healthcare crisis, but we're gonna have a homelessness crisis of epic proportion. And that's why I'm calling on this government to take real steps immediately, to work with all levels of government to ensure that people have a break on their rent and their mortgages. Uh, we've also spoken with indigenous communities who are deeply concerned about the fact that their communities have lack of ad adequate access to housing, to clean water, 
and to appropriate healthcare resources. We need to make sure there's a real plan to respond to the needs of Indigenous communities. When it comes to dealing with this healthcare crisis, immediately we're taking some bold steps and we need to make sure we do everything we can. But when we look beyond this healthcare crisis to the stimulus afterwards, we need to make sure that the focus is on workers, not on CEOs or shareholders. We need to make sure that the stimulus that we put in place is gonna encourage jobs for people and ensure that they have a livelihood. Nous pouvons stimuler l'économie et faire les choses qui peuvent transformer notre nation et lutter contre la crise climatique, construire des logements, investir dans les transports publics, faciliter l'utilisation des énergies renouvelables par les Canadiens et Canadiennes, rendre nos maisons et nos bâtiments aussi efficaces que possible sur les plans énergétiques. On peut aussi investir dans des services de garde d'enfants que toutes les familles peuvent se permettre et qui donnent à nos enfants l'éducation de haute qualité qu'ils se méritent. We also know that our healthcare system is under a deep burden and we've seen the impacts of subsequent and decades of governments who've been cutting healthcare funding. We need to make sure that our public institutions are protected and that's why we've been calling for investments in our healthcare system. I'll wrap up with this, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. I'm sorry, we're... We've got gone past our time. I thank the Honourable uh, Member for Burnaby South. Uh, before we go to uh, questions and comments, we're just going to do that other uh, momentary pause uh, while we switch up the, our operator, our wonderful uh, staff who have been helping us here over the last uh, several hours. Yes, they are doing a terrific, terrific job. And the interpreters as well have stayed here all day, I think since we started at noon today, and the rest of the team here. So thank you very much. I had to put that in. Okay, now we can go to questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I will echo the comments uh, of the Leader of the NDP that Canadians have risen to the occasion. Uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, I've dealt with a lot of uh, worried Canadians, a lot of anxious Canadians about the times that they face and uh, it's always concerning to see that. But one of the other things I've seen are Canadians uh, come together and uh, be Canadian in a way that, quite frankly, I feel like I haven't seen in a very long time. And that's very inspiring to see that, and it gives me great hope. And I know that we will come out of this on the other end stronger than when we went into it. The member, uh, the leader of the NDP, Mr. Speaker, brought up, brought up the basic, uh, basic income guarantee uh, in his uh, speech. I'm wondering if he can comment as to whether or not he thinks that going into this uh, crisis, we would have been better prepared had we had a basic income guarantee in place. A member for Burnaby South. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think we would have been better prepared if we had a stronger social safety net. I think what this crisis has shown is that our social safety net is not as robust or as strong as it could be. Uh, but I also believe that we've got an opportunity right now to, to do something pretty, pretty incredible. Faced with this crisis, we've got a decision to make. Do we choose to invest in people, make the right decisions to prevent the loss of life? We know that our healthcare systems are stretched thin and the potential spread of this illness could mean a serious potential of loss of life. And so we've got a choice to make. If we make the investments now, if we make the right choices now, provide supports for families, pr provide supports for people to stay in their homes, to have the confidence that their homes won't be, they won't lose their homes, we can make sure we get out of this crisis and, and save lives. And so that's why I call on all Canadians uh, that believe in this value that we all share, that we want to take care of one another. I believe that that's a Canadian value. I believe in Canadians, and I believe we will rise to the occasion. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Wellington Halton Hills. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to draw to the attention of this House a concern of mine. Part 18 of this bill gives the Minister of Employment and Social Services the power to change a law, to amend, add to, or remove provisions of a law simply by getting the consent of the Finance Minister and the Treasury Board President and issuing an order. This is unprecedented and it could very well be unconstitutional. To be clear, Part 18 of this bill allows a minister to bypass Parliament and amend a law by order. While I support the parts of this bill that will aid Canadians in this crisis, I cannot support Part 18 and therefore I cannot support this bill. 
I'm wondering if the member could comment. We are in a, in a national crisis and in a global crisis where we need, uh, we're facing unprecedented uh, problems where people are struggling with, uh, with unprecedented issues. And so in this time, it's important for us to take some bold measures. And while the government's proposed some strong measures to help Canadians, what I'm calling for is more immediate help and more help. Uh, what we need to do is everything we can right now to stop COVID-19 in its tracks. And that means giving people the chance to be able to stay at home. And they cannot do that without supports, without financial supports. So I believe that we've got an opportunity now to do what's right, to save lives. And to do that, we need to make sure people have money in their pocket, that they've got a job to get back to, and that their homes are protected. I think that's what we need to focus in on. And that's what I'm gonna ask the government to focus in on as well. I have time for one more short question and response. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. She's been trying to get up uh, yes, sure. uh, seven or eight times, so I've got to take her. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the recognition, um, and thank my Honourable colleague and the leader of the New Democrats for your, your comments today. Um, so my first question was about guaranteed livable income or universal basic income, so thank you for responding to that. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to see the support um, in the House, and perhaps we can have further discussions about what that could look like in Canada moving forward. Um, I do have a question uh, about kind of equality across um, regions and, and provinces as far as access to materials and supplies for dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, there are concerns in, in the province of New Brunswick uh, that we don't have kind of the, the, the public purse to uh, pursue uh, you know, suppliers directly and some of these high costs and for things that we're going to need uh, moving forward. So can the member comment on, on maybe some reassurances for some of the smaller provinces who are dealing with this issue as well? Thank you. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Fredericton, who does an incredible work, job in her community, uh, for the question and for the important issue around making sure in a country as vast as ours, in a country as diverse as ours, that all regions are able to access the supports they need and have access to the equipment they need to be able to serve their communities. This is something that is of vital importance, and I think we need to continue to be vigilant in ensuring that the government responds in a way that gives all regions, all territories and provinces access to the resources they need to be able to respond to this. This is a serious issue. It's a question of life and death. And I believe if we make the right choices, we can ensure that all Canadians get access to the help they need and that we can deal with COVID-19 in a way that we can walk out of this with their heads high. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleagues uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak here today on this important issue. We certainly are in unprecedented times. It's a remarkable thing for me to be here today representing my own riding, um, but also carrying the weight of those living in the ridings of my green colleagues for the members of Sandwich Gulf Islands, Nanaimo Ladysmith. I've also been asked to share these comments on behalf of the independent member for Vancouver Granville. I would first like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. It is essential that we remember the historical and ongoing implications of those words and the responsibilities we bear towards Indigenous communities across the nation, especially as we face this unprecedented crisis. I know I am not alone in having made this bizarre trek to Ottawa to, present, uh, to be present here for these proceedings. I made the 10-hour trip by car with my husband and two boys. Nous sommes souvent arrêtés pour acheter les licences et pour prendre une pause. Nous avons pris toutes les mesures d'hygiène recommandées. And of course, we did our best to entertain a toddler and a seven-year-old for 10 hours in the car. I think of many families and households across the nation answering difficult questions from their children and trying to keep them entertained. I feel you. To the children of Canada, we love you, and we are here for you too. We know this is a difficult time. I would like to take this opportunity to also humbly thank many, many people the frontline workers staffing our hospitals, stocking our grocery stores, and keeping our communities safe. Businesses and educational institutions for answering the call and mobilizing in a warlike effort to provide and manufacture supplies that we need. To Dr. Tam and her team for coordinating our public health response, as well as Dr. Bonnie Henry of BC for her incredible work. The tireless efforts of our cabinet ministers and their staff to coordinate a response to COVID-19 across government departments and my colleagues here in this house and those practicing social distancing at home for proving that in the face of a national crisis, we can and will work together for the people of this country. 
We gather in these extraordinary times to pass extraordinary legislation. It will allow the federal government to reach out and help Canadians directly with their personal finances. It will allow help to reach the self-employed, small and medium-sized businesses, and large corporations. I'm very relieved that a compromise was found that allows us to pass this legislation today, albeit a bit later than we had hoped. It is a fundamental principle of Westminster parliamentary democracy that Parliament controls the public purse. We cannot, even in a public health emergency, convey unprecedented powers without any oversight and without any criteria limiting those powers to any government, no matter how well-intentioned. This is a defining moment for our country. I am prouder than ever before to be Canadian and see the expedited response to this crisis. I am also so proud to be from New Brunswick. I commend Premier Higgs and Chief Medical Officer Jennifer Russell for declaring a state of emergency. For decision makers in neighboring Atlantic provinces, Nova Scotia, PEI, Newfoundland, I commend you for making the difficult decision to close your provincial borders to further protect citizens. Thank you for your leadership. We have seen more than a week now of social distancing, of closures and restrictions. Now is the time for all Canadians to comply, to do our part to get us through this together. Effective suppression would mean fewer cases of coronavirus, a fighting chance for our health care system and the humans who run it, a reduction in the number of total fatalities, a reduction in collateral damage, and gives us the time for infected, isolated and quarantined health care workers to get, back, to get better and return to work. Alors que la réponse du Canada jusqu'au précédent était rapide, il y a inévitablement les leçons que nous pouvons déjà tirer afin de s'assurer que nous sommes mieux préparés pour réagir à des catastrophes de la sortie de l'avenir. I am here to work collaboratively with my colleagues in government, but I must also point out the ways we need to improve so that we can get this right for Canadians. I'm sure we are all in the same boat when it comes to the level of correspondence with constituents over the past few weeks. We've been hearing a lot of concern. One thing the situation has made clear are the inequalities within our society. COVID-19 has amplified the challenges people are already facing. I think of the Canadians and Canadiennes who live in poverty, and particularly those and celles who are sans abri. Working Canadians who have been laid off or are facing reduced work hours, particularly at a time when they feel financially insecure. Older Canadians living on a fixed income who are worried about their pensions and investments. Indigenous peoples and the heightened challenges faced by their communities. The Canadians and Canadiennes who live in regions rural qui n'ont pas accès facilement à des services de so soins de santé. Permanent residents and other newcomers worrying about family abroad or trying to get home amidst travel cancellations. I think about our charities and not-for-profit organizations who are losing their donor base right now and really need our support. We must also stay vigilant against those who want to profit from this crisis, and they are out there. We are facing this giant together, but from very different vantage points. Almost a million people have applied for employment insurance. So far, um, I have to say, our, our Green Party has been proposing a guaranteed livable income for Canadians for years. If we had a GLI in place now, we would easily be able to ramp up payments to people facing layoffs and reduce hours without clogging the phone lines of Service Canada and scare, scaring people who are afraid of their unique situations, leaving them without support. The government measures announced are now taking time to roll out because we lack the infrastructure to quickly disseminate direct payments to Canadians. We need to have a closer look at this. It is also clear to me that if we had already made much needed improvements to our health care system, things that have been advocated by professionals, like improved infrastructure, preventative health care, pharma care, we would be much better situated to address the needs of Canadians in this COVID-19 crisis. Best estimates of what lies ahead vary widely, but we can all agree that the more we are able to maintain social distancing among those who are asymptomatic, and maintain isolation for those who have symptoms, the greater our chances are of getting through COVID-19 without overwhelming the system. The extent to which individual Canadians and businesses can follow the advice provided, provided depends on the extent of their financial ability to do so. People have to be in a financially secure position in order to take the public health advice. When we talk about the economic impacts, it seems we have left some things out, and we have discussed a few of them here today. Renters. Both residential and commercial need measures to protect them from landlords that are not passing along the goodwill of the banks or who don't have the goodwill of their bank. New Brunswick and a few other provinces have made it illegal to evict tenants for non-payment of rent. 
These measures are good, but need to be standardized across the country. Nous devons faire beaucoup mieux pour les petites et moyennes entreprises, celles qui font rouler notre économie. As Dan Kelly, President of Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses, puts it, the wage subsidies are the right measure, but the wrong amount. Our assistance measures for businesses are being dwarfed by steps taken or being contemplated elsewhere. For example, in Denmark, the government is offering up to 75% of wages, with the maximum payout per employee 10 times higher than the current offering in Canada. And there seems to be nothing for unincorporated businesses that have employees. This is a big concern. New Brunswick is allowing small businesses to defer WorkSafe New Brunswick premiums for three months. The federal government could do the same for EI, CPP, and HST. These are trying times, but we do see examples of hope all across the country. I have seen jingle dress dancers standing out in their yards, dancing for all of our collective healing. I know that we have seen churches, synagogues, mosques, and other places of worship adapting to a new reality um, and being steadfast in the support of spirituality and faith, which we need now more than ever. These are emotional times for citizens as well, and we also must consider their mental health. Get outside if you can, but maintain your social distancing. Um, go for the online museum tours, look at the, the, the zoo tours that are happening. I'm seeing people making badminton nets out of tape, uh, hide the potato, uh, baking les, les tortillas portugaises en Québécois. So we're, we're finding really creative examples to deal with this. Keep it up, call your neighbors, check in, FaceTime with your grandparents. We all have a responsibility here. Stay connected. Isolation can be a really difficult thing for each of us to face. We are setting an example of so many of us operating from home as well, and we can continue to play a leadership role here by exploring digital options for the work that we do here in the House. Let's continue to have that conversation. Today means passing this motion to ensure Canadians have the financial resources they need to make ends meet, while we rigorously follow the advice of public health experts. We will get through this if we stick together, even if that means standing apart. Thank you. Merci. We'll leave Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Similkameen Nikola. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I certainly appreciate hearing the member's uh, contribution to this debate tonight. Uh, she did mention inequality. There certainly is a number of different inequalities in this country, things that I think all of us here would like to address. One of them that I've heard from people is the uh, difference between uh, high-speed internet access in many rural areas. I'd like to ask her a little bit about uh, New Brunswick and uh, whether or not, uh, because many people, Mr. Speaker, are finding some comfort in uh, when they self-isolate, when they try to protect their families from COVID-19, uh, to be able to communicate with the outside world, to be able to make a living if they can uh, telework. Uh, so I'd like to ask her for her thoughts on that, because I know in my province of British Columbia, particularly when you get into certain parts of my area, Logan Lake, for example, Princeton is another, Karameas, this is a, a big challenge. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, th I thank my colleague for his question. And it's very important. I actually come from uh, rural New Brunswick as well. We faced um, issues with... Uh, our high-speed internet for, for quite some time, and I know that people are trying to work from home, we're trying to do Zoom conferencing, uh, finding ways to communicate in this kind of new reality that we're facing, and, and it is creating difficulties. You know, it, we've had uh, phone calls even be able, not be able to communicate with our, with our staff members or other colleagues in Parliament, so we need to look at what these services um, can provide to our rural communities, and as well as all of Canada with this, with again, this, this new reality that we face. So um, the bandwidth just can't handle what we, what we are currently seeing with a surge of people even been watching Netflix or what have you for their for their entertainment purposes but certainly for our, our work at home that we will need to be doing for who knows how long um, and those connections to our the people that we love that are so crucial we need to ensure that everyone has that access so I would hope that these are conversations that we will continue to have in this house thank you very much questions and comments honorable member for Kingston and the islands thank you very much uh, mr. speaker and I uh, um, thank the uh, um, member from Fredericton for her intervention today and in particular I want to uh, uh, congratulate her on her 10-hour car ride uh, with two young uh, children in the car, uh, being uh, um, uh, with a family with three children in it. I know how trying that can be, and um, there, congratulations on that to her through you. Um, you know, on the topic of children, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think that quite often in this discussion about what's going on with this crisis, um, we're neglecting to focus on what children might be going through. And I'm curious as a leader, uh, as a parliamentarian and as a leader in her community, what her message is to children and what her message is to um, 
parents uh, that are uh, having to deal with children that might be experiencing more anxiety now as a result of all of this. Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank my honourable colleague for his comments and, and questions today. Um, you know, being a mom of a seven-year-old, he, he understands more than the two-year-old about what's happening. And um, he chats with his friends um, and, his, and his headset oftentimes when he's playing video games to entertain himself during this time. And I've heard him um, say to, to his friends, are you worried about the coronavirus? Are you scared? Um, and I wait to hear what the response is and, and what, how he might handle that question. Um, and I hear him reassuring you know, his, his friends, saying, you know, it's okay, we're going to get through this, there's people trying to help. And so that will be my message, is that even the kids know how hard everyone is working, you know, towards this, this common goal of, of, of fighting COVID-19 as a nation, and that's what it's going to take to really get us over, the, over that peak, is that staying together, understanding how important it is to heed the warnings of, of public health, um, and ensuring that we do stay connected. So I think my other message would be, um, let's change the narrative a bit about the, the social distancing, and let's really focus on the physical distancing with social connection, because that is so crucial right now. We really need to protect that. Thank you very much. Uh, questions and comments? Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I just want to acknowledge the, uh, the incredible speech given by the member from Fredericton, touching on uh, the trials of a family coming from 10 hours away to the hope that we have in the coming together while maybe physically standing apart. I think that was a beautiful analogy. Um, in our, our coming together, once we get past the, the first stage, the, the impacts of COVID-19 directly on health, there'll be a second phase where we look at stimulus to get people back to work and to get people uh, with, to ensure they have good jobs. In that stimulus, uh, I want to hear from the member uh, your thoughts on, uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, thoughts on how we can ensure that the help goes to workers and doesn't end up being a blank check to corporations without ensuring that there's guarantees or strings attached that assure people and workers that they're going to have the jobs. Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague and the leader of the New Democrats. Um, excellent question. This is something that I was, I've been you know, asked by, by the media, I've been asked by some of my constituents on, on some of the, the comments that are floating around about perhaps bailing out the oil and gas industry or, or other corporations um, that are involved in, in different sectors. Um, and my response is that first, let's look after the individual Canadians, the workers, um, but they certainly do need jobs to go back to. And so I think we just need to be really careful about the future that we're, that we're planning. You know, my honourable colleague um, from the block mentioned as well that when we're in an economic crisis, it sets the stage for what's to come. And so this is the time for us to make really bold changes to what we want to see in our future here in Canada. And I think those bold changes include uh, looking at you know, expanding other sectors. And of course, I'm very supportive of things like renewable energy um, and, and other ways that we can, you know, maximize our energy output and, and still have Canadians feel that we have, uh, you know, a great role to play in the global stage. But I do feel we need to be careful about where we place our investments moving forward and to understand how the markets are fluctuating and what that looks like moving forward in response to COVID-19. But I think we need to be cautious, but fo focus first and foremost on the workers and individual Canadians who need money in their pockets now. Thank you very much for your question. Alors, euh, comme il est euh, 5h50, euh, conformément à l'ordre adopté plus tôt aujourd'hui, la Chambre procédera maintenant à la mise aux voix de la motion important deuxième lecture et renvoie à une comité plénière de projet de loi C-13, loi concernant certaines mesures en réponse à la COVID-19. Mr. Morneau, seconded by Ms. Haidu, moves that Bill C-13, an act respecting certain measures in response to COVID-19, be now read a second time and referred to the Committee to A, uh, pardon me, Committee of the Whole. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Yes. Yes? yes. Agreed? No. Oh, I hear a no. All those in favor of the motion will, on, on division, carried on division? I declare the motion carried on division. Second reading of this bill, deuxième lecture de ce projet de loi. Accordingly, the bill is deemed considered in Committee of the Whole, deemed reported without amendment, deemed concurred in at report stage, deemed read a third time and passed. 
Troisième lecture de ce projet de loi, third reading of this bill. And before we go to the adjournment, I just want to say on behalf of all members uh, to extend our appreciation to, as has been mentioned here many times today, uh, to the dedicated, uh, just hold that for a moment, we're getting there, <laughs> to the employees of this place and in our constituencies who continue to support members in their service to Canadians during these extraordinary circumstances. Et uh, je m'en voudrais uh, de ne pas offrir ma plus chaleureuse reconnaissance aux travailleurs uh, de la santé de première ligne, aux spécialistes de la santé publique et aux premiers intervenants de tout le Canada pour le courage et l'énergie sans fin avec lesquels ils protègent la santé et la sécurité des Canadiens. Accordingly, and pursuant to an order made earlier today, the House stands adjourned until Monday, April 20th, 2020, at 11 a.m., pursuant to Standing Orders 28-2 and 24-1.